Hello and welcome to the Leaking Cast. This is the Giant Bomb Community's Guild Wars 2 podcast for the week of July 14th. I'm your host, Zalkovist Cynic, and Nubarama and Rawson cannot join us this week, but we still have Durin. This isn't the Secret World Podcast. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> And, and a bunch of returning guests this week uh, to fill out those spots. And because we want them back, Shinboy630, welcome back. Hello. I've been playing lots of video games. None of which are Guild Wars. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mage Knight? This isn't Star Wars. What if you're and done? Turkey. And thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> I want Guild Wars 2. Aww. There we go. At, at least we have fanboys on the show this week. We have a <laughs> fanboy to take new spot. Um, not that I'm not a fanboy. Anyway... So this week is a bunch of news. We're not going to be touching a lot of it. We actually had to cut a bunch of news because there's just so much this week. We're going to be uh, bringing Endgame into our main discussion topic. Uh, so just wait for that. Also, we will not be doing um, what we've been playing at the start of this episode. We'll probably try and remember to put it at the end of the episode. We'll talk about it then. But until then, we'll jump straight into the news this week. So the first thing I want to do today is state that uh, as a public service announcement, there's a 1.4 gig update to the beta client. You should probably check that out and download it before you hit the beta next weekend and realize you have to download that and perhaps even another one as the week goes on before you can even start playing. So I'd do that as soon as possible and probably check out Reddit and the Giant Bomb forums to see if there's another one during the week. So that's just a public service announcement. But we will jump into the news. The first thing we want to talk about this week is, and I don't, we don't have Noob. This is horrible. We don't have Noob <laughs> to do the Newcaster voice. Oh, it's just, we'll, just we'll me. We'll have to survive somehow. <laughs> exactly. I, I'll, I'll just have to... We, <sighs> we'll have to read it in a normal voice, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, well, just, it, it's just such a downer. How boring. Yeah, we, we, don't, even have Zoom, we don't even have Zimmy Ramen here to do a proper English accent. Yeah. The BBC voice? Oh. <laughs> God, I feel so. I feel so sorry for the people who who just joined us last week, and thanks to everyone who started listening last week for the first time. But yeah, what we do in the show is we actually have a revolving cast. Like we have a couple main guys: me, Duran, Rawson, and Nubarama. But Zumi Ramen, I know some of you wanted him to come back, and he will be back later as we get closer to release. But anyway, today the first news topic is Asurin Savari confirmed for the next beta weekend, and this happened like the day after we recorded last time. I know it's old news by now, but I definitely want to talk about it. So, what's everyone's reactions to Asura and Savavi finally being confirmed? Durin, I know you had something to say. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm super <laughs> excited about it. Like, I, um, I, I, I'd held off watching that uh, GameSpot Asura video because I, I had plans of uh, saving the Asura content until launch. Um, How'd that go? That How'd lasted that? until about <laughs> a day ago. Yeah, yesterday. I pretty much just watched the entire video straight through yesterday. Um, oh, and goddamn. I, I, They're adorable. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, they, they, I, just I love their animations. Like I love their, their stopping animation when they're running. Like They nearly fall over. That's so great. <laughs> it's That's so good. great. They're just like little mad scientists. I love it. And they're such a <laughs> They're such love jerks it. to one another. Like, they are. They're really like, snarky. And <laughs> yeah, like they're all very intelligent, but clearly... Each of them think they are the most intelligent, and the rest are just fucking shit. I think it's my favorite part of them. It's just they're like they're just super egomaniac, like scientist mentality. Yeah, it's and, and, so and don't even get me started on humans. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the Norn are kind of stuffy with all their honor and hunting and, yeah. and crap like that. I just want to just crazy magic experiments and tiny people. <laughs> adorable tiny people because you can make him so small like he there, there was like a character create creator on video that went up uh by some like dude from like france or something uploaded to the youtube channel and people found it on reddit and it's you can, you can watch it. i think it's still available but you can make like the dumpiest littlest asura <laughs> with like a giant fro if you wanted to it's amazing i can't wait to get my hands on that afro asura the afro, afro asura confirmed coming to, coming to adult swim tonight <laughs> midnight <laughs> <laughs> so Mage Knight, what, what you, uh, is anyone here uh, excited about Savari Mage Knight? What are your thoughts here? <laughs> Not particularly. I mean, plant people oh. are cool, but I don't know. Uh, I'm really? more excited about Asura. I, I, Savari don't really do it for me. It's all about wow. the Asura. Do, 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 you, do you enjoy their characters? Uh, you're like the first I, person who I've said, who I've talked to, who's like, oh, Savari doesn't really do it for me. Uh, the art looks nice, but I don't know. It's just green people it's not my thing <laughs> i i was actually <laughs> i was actually with mage knight originally like i i had the same idea like they, they were kind of like okay they're they're a cooler version of elves i I'm, i can get behind that but um after um actually listening to the guild cast uh last week 
Uh, they talked a little bit about about it on there, and they talked a little bit about the the uh, the backstory for them, and kind of finding out that they like they're they as a race have only existed for like what twenty years or something. Twenty five. And so like they have twenty five, I think. Yeah. Yeah, like they have this this like kind of uh, uh um oh, I don't even know how to describe it, but just. Th- the way that they act is very like proper and you know very kind of respectful of everything and and but yet there's this like childhood or ch- childlike curiosity about them yeah about it's, everything it's, 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 it's like they're in awe of everything yeah yeah, yeah. And, I, and I really like the the like kind of the the mix of those two and and I'm interested to see how that's going to kind of how they will interact with you know people like the char or you know the humans or something yeah it'll be fun. <laughs> Machine Boy, what, what are your what are your thoughts? What what are you looking forward to this beat? Are you excited about the Silvarian Silvari and Sura? I love the Silvari. Um I don't know, like the whole like dream thing and uh how they're pretty much oh, yeah. the enti- the entire race is pretty much just devoted to to discovery and trying to figure out what everything means and everything like that. I think that's super interesting. So yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited about it. Have you read um Edge of Destiny? Yes. Yeah, ugh, that was did, a bad book. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you like Kate's character? I, I did I, that, like that's pretty much she character. sold me on the on the uh, the um, how I think the general chatter from the Silvari will be like with the, the really off kilter, like different perspective on the, how things work in the world. Like mm-hmm. for example, um, she's just like confused about conflict, like in general. But she's fine with killing <laughs> things. But like when people are arguing, she just thinks it's silly. Like th- things like yeah. that are just like really cool. Yeah, and I'm Killing like a fan of. Uh, hmm? Yeah. Anyway, I'm a fan of things that are Wait, sort what of was like. That? <laughs> Killeen was better. Killeen? Yes. Who? She's the Silvari necromancer from Ghosts of Ascalon. Oh, yeah. that's cr- I-, I haven't read Ghosts of Ascalon. That was I- a better I- book. I pretty much soured on. Really? I, I, was it a good book, or was it just better? I would say it was average. I wouldn't call it bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You wouldn't call it bad. So that's a step up, you, yeah. you'd say. Okay. Didn't that come out first of the two? Uh, yeah, the, the lore aspects of it were, were somewhat interesting. Right. Okay, cool. And uh, just to, to move on quickly, because this is like the perhaps the least interesting piece of news this week, for me at least, because uh, th- there's just so much awesome shit. Tarkin, what are, what are your thoughts on the Savari and Sura being there? I don't like weekend? the Asura. I agree. I think you guys are <laughs> insane. You guys. Wow. Yeah, fuck you guys. It's going to be. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Because uh. w- whenever I see the Asura, I see a little kid who thinks he's smarter than everyone. Yes. And he bites. Oh my god. Yes. But no, have you seen the Tarkin, team? The, differ- the difference is. <laughs> They are smarter than everyone. <laughs> and they know it, so they're obnoxious assholes about it. Exactly, but at least, you know, at least, you know they can, they not only talk the talk, but they can walk the walk. Doesn't mean they yeah. shouldn't stop talking. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking forward to the, the uh, Asura quest, because I think they could have some really interesting quest potential with all their crazy magical experiments and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully they like pull some, themselves some up. The, some of the stuff they showed in the, the GameSpot thing was really interesting with just in terms of, of quest mechanics and what they can do with that. That's, yeah, ex- exactly. Like, just the straight-up madness of Radisum. Even though I've no, I haven't seen it. Like, I've been avoiding seeing that main city. But I, I just know from from the series that it's, it's going to be crazy stuff in yeah. terms of, like, diversity of quests in their area and stuff like that. Um, the, well, like the mini, the, the one-hour game spot show, I don't want to get too far ahead, but the one-hour game spot thing where they showed, like, the little... Um, the mini, uh, not, not, not like a strategy game, but it's more like a, a rock 'em sock 'em robots kind of thing. Yeah. With the two golems that can kind of move on around. You can punch each other and shit. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I can't wait. They still have uh, like but, a, but a the, polymock system in or something like that in the first poly... game. That was the, I it, seen the remember movie. in Eye of the North. The, um, it was like, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. It was kind of like Pokemon where you had like different like things that you collected and had picked your party of three and had them battle against each other. Well, clone. I'd never heard of any of that. <laughs> and Guild Wars 2. I know you, know, you can collect little figurines, but I think that's about no, it. No, it was an Azura thing, so I haven't really been paying attention to much of the Azura gameplay because I don't like them as a race. So I was just curious. Yeah. So the, one, one thing that came up with the announcement of this, and you can check it out it's on the uh, Readnet blog, but the thing is here is that they announced the new races, right? But what they didn't do was tell us whether they're going to be wiping the characters or not. So I was I was talking about Tarkin. We watched me and Tarkin watched Spider Man recently. Um, it was okay. 
That's, that's about as much as I'm going to say about that movie. But I can't um, wait to see how you the, tie this into all of this here. And on, on, on the um, <laughs> while we were we were lining up for McDonald's before the movie, we were talking about how they didn't say they were going to wipe the characters, but what they have been doing for the last like bunch of press releases about uh, you know like a stress tests, betas, so on and so forth, is that being hey, we, be, we won't be wiping the characters of this one. Hey, we won't be wiping the characters of this one. Hey, guys, don't worry. We're not going to be wiping your characters. Like, they, they've said it every single time. And my argument is, well, they kind of just don't have to say it again. Like, they just kind of... I guess it's, like, a given now that they're not going to wipe the characters. That's that's my opinion, anyway. Yeah, I Char- think it's, right? it's going to continue that way. So, wait. So, Mage Knight, do, do you actually... Um, do, do you think that's a good thing? Or, like, what are your opinions on it? I think, do you think uh, continuing the characters is, is just fine? I don't know. It's, there doesn't seem to be too much problem with it. Yeah, I, I somewhat agree. There are definitely positives and negatives. We talked about this before. Durin? Um, well, when we talked about it before, I had said that I felt like they kind of needed to not wipe them. That way, you know, some of the higher level content could still be tested. And there'll be plenty of people still testing the new areas. Um, but that was, I believe, before we knew the release date and that this was going to be the last beta weekend, I think. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that with this being the last beta weekend and them not doing, as far as we know, them not doing any kind of a, a soft launch, uh, I think that this is their chance to kind of uh, really do a big stress test that would be as close to uh, simulating a proper launch if they were to do a reset just because then everybody that goes in on this beta event, which is going to be more than there ever was. I mean, we saw Curse was giving out 20,000 beta keys for so this weekend many event. Um, on top of everybody who who has you know pre-ordered and pre-purchased even since the, the first and second beta weekends, there's going to be a lot of people playing this. And I think that it could be smart of them to go ahead and, and wipe all the characters and really simulate as, as close to a launch um, scenario as they really can get, you know, aside from doing a straight up... Uh, soft launch so while i didn't think before that they would um like you said they have they haven't you know they've been saying you are not gonna wipe your characters we're not gonna wipe your characters i think there, there are a couple different ways you can look at it th- in this time around like you say that they don't they kind of don't need to say it but i almost feel like maybe them not saying it <laughs> might actually yeah. be a hint that maybe they're going to because they always yeah, exactly. they always said it's a good point yeah they've always said that that you know there was a potential that they were going to wipe characters for beta weekends and so they've always kind of had to say, like, no, we're not going to wipe it this time. No, we're not going to wipe it this time. But, like, by them not saying anything, it could be like, no, we're, yeah, we're totally going to wipe it this time. Yeah, come around. You've convinced me. I think it's a good idea to, like, uh, simulate that flood of people into the, the starter area, see how they handle under, like, massive stress. I'm sure this is going to be the biggest beta weekend because it's the last one and Absolutely, the closest yeah. to launch. So it's, it'd be a good idea to just, like, see how those, those early areas handle a uh, large influx of players. Yeah, and like I know for me, um, if they keep the characters, I already have like a level thirty something Norn. I'm not gonna really want to go in and play the Azura starter area. I'm gonna do the Savari one because that's what I'm interested in. But if they wipe the characters, I figure I might, you know, go. Hey, I don't have any other characters to play on. I might as well make an Azura, see if I like the zone, and test it out. Especially since they've been rebalancing the, the difficulties of the starter zones too, so it'd be good to uh, get that fully tested out by a large number of people that's true too yeah with, with them kind of that that rebalance is going to affect all of the starter zones obviously not just the new ones so yeah they can mm-hmm. definitely use that and noob's going to be so pissed that he can't be here to tell me i told you so <laughs> 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 well we'll see like again we don't we can't really confirm one way true. or another and at this point of recording they haven't said they're wiping or not even on twitter and stuff i don't think they even responded to people who've asked that kind of question so I, I, another, a third way of looking at it could be that they're just not sure whether they're wiping the characters yet, because it could just be straight up a technical thing. Like, for example, like a bunch of um, deep-seated changes are happening to a bunch of classes, which we discussed last week, including the warrior and engineer specifically, and I think a bunch is happening to a thief as well. Um, so stuff like that with existing characters that they just might not be able to transfer, or just could be like incompatible between builds. Like It could be something as simple as that, and just them making sure if they can one way or another. Um, Turkey, what are your, what are your thoughts? You've been pretty quiet on this. I'm thinking. Is he here? S- same with Jerem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, they're gonna wipe characters. Okay, but so do, do you believe that because of their wording, or just like what they should do? I'm thinking, uh, based on their wo- wording. Okay. Because of how they've done it so far, like they've always said, we could wipe at any time. Yeah, yeah, they have said that as well. And also, like, in that. 
Like, also, the announcement that they were not going to wipe characters has been in the same post as the announcement of the beta event or stress test. And the fact that they didn't say anything last time makes me kind of think that they're going to wipe them. I, I would agree with that. However, I will say that this is kind of the furthest out that we've had news of a beta weekend. Yeah, that's usually, true. Usually it's been like kind of the, right like the week before they'll make the announcement. Because uh, yeah, we're within a week like, now, so you would think the announcement would have to come soon. Yeah. yeah. I doubt they'll I was, do it like the day before. Yeah, no, I, I think if we don't hear anything by probably Monday or Tuesday, then it's, I mean, at that point we don't know, but it's most likely, I think, going to be a wipe. They could have a midweek follow-up post with details, but could probably be. not. Well, you know, they might actually, given these updates they've been doing, just to make, make everyone you know, sure, you're like, you know, hey, I know we put out that big update you all probably caught, but we're doing another one, so make sure you update again or something. And then in that mention, with that, we're also wiping, or with that, we're not wiping. Right. Yeah, and just stuff like if the update, and as I said earlier in the PSA, is only 1.4 gigs. And that's that it can't be big enough. Unless unless we've already downloaded a bunch of this serious stuff, that can't be big enough for these two new areas and all the voice acting, stuff like that. Like, so there will probably be another update during the week. And it's something I didn't, I guess we could talk about here. I, what do you guys feel about the, because, uh, all right, let, let's rewind. There is There was an update to the client for the beta, which I talked about in the PSA, but on, on top of that, they've actually also implemented a new login system in that you actually enter your login details into that updated client. And the reason I think that ties into this beta is because they're trying to put in character swapping without having to log out um, of, your, of your account to be able to swap your characters. This could be a like um, a midpoint between where they want to be now, when it, when it wouldn't be towards release like that's why kind of why i didn't want to talk about it too much but there is a bunch of things missing from here like for example if you open the beta client up now and you update it and you, you get the that 1.4 gigs of downloads and we'll probably get more towards the end of the week but um you you now have a login as part of the beta client but you're missing the chroma key and for people who don't know what the chroma key or chroma hash was from before is when you type in a password for your account um, when you finish typing it, you'll see a sp- three colors next to your pass- the password box. And those three colors are actually unique to a specific combination of characters in a specific way. Um, I don't believe you can backtrace those three colors to what your like what the actual characters were. I think there's a bunch of different combinations to get any specific set of colors. I think that's how chroma keys work. But either way... So once you have those three colors, you can then know that if you typed in the wrong password or you just misspelled your password, by just looking at those three colors next to your password box, that this was in there for previous beaters, you can tell by that. So like for me, I think it was like green, red, and purple. If I see green, red, and purple, that means I know for certain that I've typed in the right password, unless by some weird chance I got a different combination to get that same color. But even missing one letter on my password completely changed it. It was like orange, blue, and green when I typed it in incorrectly, even just leaving out a single letter somewhere in there. So it was a really great system, but they've taken it out for this current iteration of the beta client, which I'm not sure is even worth talking about because that's probably just like a mid-step to release. But I've again, if everyone is listening, go ahead. What, what exactly is the advantage of this as opposed to over just hitting enter and saying your password's wrong? Like, am I just missing something? Well, I, most things lock you out. Of, yeah. If, if you get your password too many times, it's just it's just nice. Like, it's not a huge feature, but it's mm-hmm. you know, it's a courtesy. Yeah, because yeah, I, I had noticed them obviously. I just wasn't sure like what what practical purpose they served. At least for me. Yeah, it's it's, it's like um because the chroma key isn't remembered by the client, so essentially it's just for you as a visual indicator. For example, um, typing in your password incorrectly and just seeing the chroma hash and chroma key, uh, you, you get a visual indicator of whether you did it incorrectly without having to hit enter, without having to touch their login servers. So not only freeze their login servers up in terms of loading, they don't have to keep um, kicking out players. They also, as uh, Mage and I correctly pointed out, don't have to worry about straight up banning players, for example, or like locking out people from their accounts because they typed in their password a bunch of times. That'll still happen. For example, that they'll still gate people trying to brute force hack other people's passwords, um, which is why they have to do the other method as well. But as, as a personal kind of thing, you'd be able to tell without even having to um, hit the enter key whether you've typed it incorrectly, which is, yeah, as I said, it's, it's a convenience thing. Also, I think Durin noted that... Um, if this is how they're going to be character swapping, then they're going to be missing the awesome splash screen. Yeah, I want my fucking music back. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. Like, this is serious, face. I want my music back. 
<laughs> well, we don't know if it's gone yet. current uh, yeah. tag that you can add into your shortcut to launch the old launcher. Yeah, but how long will that be around? I mean, That's a good question. It's a good question. <laughs> I, I, keep I, it. If this is how they're going to be going to forward, I, I'm in risk of losing my room. my splash screen music. And this, this, <laughs> this is a problem. Me. Yeah, <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> Just sitting there watching that too, and most of my Guild Wars Two experience has been in that splash screen. It's very nostalgic. <laughs> 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 Indeed, oh, well, I, yeah, it, it was it was too well done to not put in the final game. It was yeah, just really nice. cool looking. Yeah, that's a good point. Screen. Yeah, I, be either way, like we don't know if that's gone or not. So I, I think we can move on to the next topic. Hey, Asura and Survivor are in the game. Happy, happy. So. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is when, once they actually announced the Asura and Silvari for this next beta, uh, pretty much like an hour later or two, within two hours from that, GameSpot had an hour long, uh, over an hour long segment on their now playing stuff on their site. So www.gameswat.com. If you search for Gear Wars 2, Gear, so Gear Wars 2 on there, you'll find it on there. But um, essentially, it was a video of them running through the Asura starting area as an Asura character creation, that kind of stuff. Um, it was absolutely cool like is there any reaction that during what, what were your actual thoughts from that i want to play an asura like, so I, bad yeah like i like i was saying earlier i love the, their uh some of the things they're doing with the questing uh i love the the personality in the asura um they showed a, a real basic uh, i guess not really basic they showed a jumping puzzle um and that was really cool that was kind of the first time i'd seen one aside from the crazy uh world view world one which I oh, again, yeah. do not recommend anyone try. Oh God, are you talking about? You're not talking about the little ones. You're talking about the huge one in like the 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 meta space above the map. Yeah, the right? one where they they did like two kind of shorter ones, and then the Gamespot guy was like, "Oh, that was cool," and he's like, "No, that's that was just that was the beginning. Now we're actually into it." Like, and then he big, goes through this portal, and he's like in the, the sky with like clouds around him and stuff. Yeah, and there's like yeah. floating platforms. Oh my, like God. stuff like that looked looked really really cool, and just kind of I like. I kind of the the zone itself, I, like in terms of the environment, maybe outside this outside obviously their city, uh, the environment itself, eh, maybe a little generic. I guess yeah, I, it's, it, it it's was... kind of generic as far as like crazy magic stuff happening, but I think it's well, no, kind of cool. I mean, just kind of generic fantasy forest. Oh, oh, Savari, right? Oh, no, 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 around, no, 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 Asura. Wait, oh, Asura. Yeah, right. just well, of, they're in the same jungle, so yeah, it's it's just a kind uh, of generic fantasy jungle surroundings with you know their crazy. I, magic I didn't stuff get that on. from it. I, I actually, actually, I haven't seen. Did, that, I, I haven't even seen that part. <laughs> a, a bunch of it could be like just the the art direction, with, but the fact that when you're like running through, there's like um, for example, like dewdrops, not dewdrops, but like mist or say so what it ends up is that there's like golden glowy floaty things as you run there could be insects or whatever mm-hmm. and there's like the beautiful like effects around like the plants and stuff and there's like uh, the, the grass looks different to the grass outside of the jungle for example the, the the gliding effects are all different it looks more like um blue green hues versus like the golden kind of green from the outside or like yeah. the brownish yeah. hues from like the char area i just i love I, I i fell in love with that 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 Maguma jungle stuff. I think it was the Maguma jungle, but yeah. Yeah, I think I think um, it looks I'm, good. It's just like I said. It to me, have, you know, this is a fantasy. It looks night There are a lot of fantasy. It looks night it, Yeah, it does. And, and yeah, it's, maybe it's that's fun. why. Maybe that's why I see it as generic fantasy jungle because Night Elf kind of is the uh, the, the easiest one to recall for me because that that's you know the one I spent the most time in. Um, yeah. But yeah, like it, there are some cool features they're putting in there. there you know, there's some cool little details, like you said, with the the little bugs and stuff and the you know grass colored and like that, that stuff's neat but like i said it's just it's it is i mean it's no different than you want you know you boil down the human area and it's like okay this is you know generic fantasy farmland it's just yeah nothing to write home about at all that's that's well i i feel that with the human well i guess it just all comes down to whether you're a huge arena net like art junkie like me i, I just anything they do pretty much i I love the look of the human starting area it looks absolutely fantastic to me so but no you're you're right it, it does it it was i think more people were impressed by like the asura stuff than necessarily the jungle itself like yeah. I, I i love the whole like asura architecture it's very dwarf like yeah not like somewhat no, it's it's angular and it, it, yeah you know, but it belies like ultra intelligent ultra efficient race 
Yeah, oh, I think yeah, yeah I think what they what they filled it with was really cool. And and again, like I was watching this on a you know non HD video, so clearly <laughs> yeah, it'll look a lot better in the game. I mean, like you said with the human area, the human area does look amazing um, when you're in game, but maybe doesn't translate as well when you're watching a 360p video. Uh, so. st- oh wow, three six. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Yeah. I, I was I down. <laughs> I think I've, I've I'm still abusing that um giant bomb GameSpot HD thing. Anyway. Ah, um, yes. So moving on from that, I think that the major piece of news from that, though, and the reason I brought it up in the first place is there's a bunch of like changes people observed from looking at this. So obviously, there are things like um, they now added a clock to the left top left hand corner of the screen, so you Exciting. can you know, yeah, you, can, you know what time it is in day uh, in game. Um, there's also stuff like uh, they've changed how damage numbers are displayed. So if you're doing like a channeled skill, it doesn't keep adding each tick. So for example, a volley from a uh, we're just guessing and extrapolating, but I'm assuming this is the case, and it very much seems to be the case. Um, if you're doing a volley as a rifle warrior, instead of it being um, 1,500, 3,000, 4,500, 6,000, 7,500, and it'll just say 7,500 about the character by the end of the volley. So it's it's hard to... Some people think that they're additive in that the 6,000 tick adds to 7,000 uh, ticks. Yeah, so when you yeah. actually did it with 20,000 damage, that's not the case. It's actually only 7,000 damage. So they took that out entirely. Now it just says the damage for each tick, which is better. Stuff like that. Um, yeah, I like that change. I, don't think, I think it's less informative, actually. I kind of like being able to know what the total damage of the, uh, the, the volley is doing. But... You are right that it is not immediately intuitive. Like I, I don't really know if it's if it's additive or yeah. I think a, it's, uh, I, th- I think a really good like middle ground could have been if they did something like maybe a, a counter that went up really quickly as the damage started to go up. Like that could yeah, I, yeah, that could yeah, actually yeah. look really cool. I, I guess, but in in the end, like um, the the main people it is useful for. Are like three theory crafters like me and Jimbo and stuff like who really want to see hey how much damage does the volley do versus a um the the equivalent from the ranger like a longbow versus rifle what are you seeing in terms of comparative DPS stuff like that is useful but for like the average player I think as 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 we've all pointed out essentially the um confusion which could come from that kind of display method uh is counterproductive to what Renet's trying to do is in making this game accessible but also hardcore like it's, it's kind of trying to straddle that line and i thought that the additive um display method was a, b- a bit towards more towards the guys who really know what they they want and what they're looking for in terms of damage that kind of stuff so either way that, that's that's all aside from the point like there's like small changes and we're not sure if they're keeping them for release they're probably just testing them out but in my opinion all the ones they did were beneficial the main one that i do want to talk about here though is the addition of vistas so um I, I, i've been talking a lot turkey do you do you know what vistas are? can can you explain it to the rest of us well vistas are well you have to do a small jumping puzzle to reach them but when you reach them they give you a camera flyover of the area so it's a small cinematic. And yeah, you, you exactly. Know. So it's like back in, um, for for example, earlier in, in the previous betas, when you go to Holbeck, for example, um, what are you looking at in terms of the map completion and just in general looking around the map and you hit the M key, there's points of interest around the place, right? And so points of interest, what they are currently is that you walk up to them and it's just an interesting thing if, if you can like um either like a, a good view of a huge um like hole in hole brick or in terms of like the, the um any form of starting area, pretty much everywhere across the map there's like really nice views stuff like that that they want to highlight by putting a thing called points of interest but for some of those places um they are not all of them i have to say that specifically not all points of interest are converting but for some of those places they felt like it, it wasn't enough to make someone go to that out of the way place for a point of interest and there was maybe more there that they could show a player by using something like a dynamic camera kind of sweep over that kind of thing versus just the player standing there and like scrolling around with their mouse so what they did was some of them actually are going to be converted to and adding more as well some of them are going to be converted to a thing called a um let's see what i've written in here it was a and did someone can come can someone come up with this for me what was it called? They have a name for it. Oh, it, the it was a new Vistas. Vista. Vista. Oh, I just said it. Anyway. Windows Vista. So it's, it's, it's yeah, for me, I'm, I'm going to wait for the, the next version of Windows 7. 
<laughs> <laughs> so the Chronicle of Vista. So what, what that means is when now when you maybe complete a jumpy puzzle or get to a harder place to find by specific like routes in the map, when you get there, there's this big like map, like floating map kind of thing with like a with a light beam on it. So you, you know from looking at it from a way like maybe like a couple of hundred units away that where it'll be or, or where, where it's going to be in the map or maybe get an idea of how to get up there. So when you walk up to this map and you hit E against it like a scout, it kind of takes control away from you. But instead of like a scout where it shows the overview of the map, it actually brings the camera out and like sweeps around what it's they like want to show It's like a scout in 3D space. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. So I think and, it's a really good idea. Yeah, yeah and, it's, and it rewards players who want to go into those harder to get two places. Now well, we are the probably, map icons going to be different? Um, I don't, they didn't really talk about that. Uh, yes, we probably, should probably I believe they're that, adding a new like completionist point and they're going to be adding more okay. of those beyond oh, okay. converting some from points of interest. So it looks like, it looked like two mountains. I, th- I think that was the, the image on it, but, um, yeah, this is a new completionist thing, I believe for Vistas. So you can also add that to people who want hundred percent everything, but any, any other questions? I think you had another one. Shinboy was it? Or, uh, no, I, was, I, I was just going to say, yeah, that, um, they, we should probably note that, like you know, like points of interest, these are a hundred percent optional. It's not like this is something you need to do. This is you get experience for them. Uh, I I think so because they they kind of compared them to points of interest. So I think like points of interest, you'll get probably an, an equivalent amount of experience for for discovering these. Oh yeah, yeah, I believe you would. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. but they're really just there for completionists and just to kind of kind of, kind of to, to highlight a lot of the amazing artwork that the art art team has done, and it tends to get kind of over, overlooked in a lot of games. That's actually could be useful for like cities like Little Lions Archers, a little uh, daunting at first, but maybe a fly through would help you navigate a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, that's that would be point. cool as well. Man, I, I just love I just love the scouts so much that anything yeah. like a scout they put in, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally happy with them. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm totally happy with them. So that's that's one interesting thing that added to the game, and I, and I really love the idea of that. There's also been some other stuff that came out this week. Um, the major piece of news, as again. We'll, as I said, uh, we'll get to a major discussion point this week. But um, between now and then, I did want to touch on this. Uh, Durin, there was a Colin Johansson interview, uh, the second part of that Guild Wars 2 Hub interview. After the previous beta, they, um, Colin Johansson uh, came up to them and they talked about uh, stuff like their reactions to the beta and w- what they plan to change between beta and release and between then and this next beta. Um, so one of the major things he touches upon is when asked about the difficulty of Guild Wars 2 and how like some new players, not necessarily all of it, uh, some people think it's really easy, some people think it's really hard, but a lot of new players, the general consensus is it's pretty hard in some cases to get into. And difficulty is a huge part of that. Like I, I, I believe his reaction to it was really interesting. So during, if you want to read it out first, I think it was line 18. Yeah, I should probably apologize to everyone ahead of time. Unfortunately, I don't have Noob's BBC voice, so we're just going to get <laughs> plain old Durin voice. Uh, but he says, We're constantly testing and tweaking everything in the game to try to find those sweet spots we're really happy with. As I mentioned earlier, the level 1 through 5 areas were oftentimes too difficult for new players back in the first beta event, and we did a lot of work to make those a little easier for the second beta event. Another change we made between beta events 1 and 2 is we raised the level cap that mobs start to learn various abilities. Other than bosses, things like mobs using AoE skills now occur a little later in the game, and mobs using various conditions have been pushed back based on the condition they use. All of this was provided, all of this was was to provide a slightly better learning progression in the game, so when you get to the point where creatures are using their full sets of abilities, you are far enough along playtime wise to better understand how to deal with those situations. Uh, Some of those things were straight up balanced wrong too, uh, like the flame shaman, and we've been identifying and trying to address those as well. Yeah, uh, Tarkin, I think he has something to say about the, the Flame Shaman specifically. The Flame Shaman, oh man. That was the <laughs> was that best it? experience. Was that was that all you're giving me? Beta Weekend <laughs> 1, a sea okay, of yeah. dead. It's like 50, 60 people lying dead trying to fight it. Oh, yeah, so for people not familiar with it, it was like um, uh, just right next to the, the char starting areas, just outside of Black Citadel, there is a cave with a string of dynamic events, and one of them results in, well, the end of them results in this flame shaman boss coming out, a veteran flame shaman. And because it was like a ne- level it's 5 a champion, area on the edge of... Veteran. Okay, yeah, there, there you go. A ch- champion, and he walks out, and because it's like between a level 7 area and like a level 3 or 2 area, um, if he gets le- like pulled the wrong direction then the level twos and stuff get that dynamic event pop up and a bunch of them obviously run towards it um 
and it's pretty much like a bunch of dudes running uphill towards a machine gun. It was it was pretty much just like a sea of. Uh, we described it in one of the one of the first thinking cast episodes actually as a, a literal sea of corpses. Like there was just <laughs> Holy crap. tens, that tens terrifying. of like level two Your or three revival XP. dead people. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, all that, all that revival XP. <laughs> oh no, you, you wouldn't get a chance because he target like back then he targeted people who were trying to revive other people. So I, I I actually died that way. I walked up to it, tried to revive someone, and then died a minute later. So it was just <laughs> another one on that continually expanding sea of courses. It was really cool. Um, it was good because like how me and Tarkin looked at it was, um, hey, it was like one of those instances where Green goes, hey, this game ain't for noobs. Like it was, it was awesome. Like, it was it was like a sudden hard spike, which I I enjoy it. Like being a Dark Souls liker, I, I'm I'm pretty much um, totally fine with them um, being like making difficult points in this game. So when I heard this news here, like it was straight up um, them readjusting conditions, like moving them towards higher like for example i assume enemies who use the confusion condition won't be as pre- prevalent earlier in the game as in confusion for the people know uh for, sorry for people who don't know or is a condition which goes on you and every time you use a skill you take damage um and that can scale in like intensity pokemon. so <laughs> <laughs> like pokemon exactly <laughs> um so hopefully like less enemies will use that towards the start of the game so it'll give people a greater chance to get used to it but I'm not the only one with opinions. Duran, what, what, what do you think on when it comes to difficulty and what they're making in terms of changes? Having been playing a lot of The Secret World, I'm going to say that uh, difficulty like this early on fucking sucks. And <laughs> yeah, definitely. I am absolutely okay <laughs> with them kind of tuning things down a little bit early on and, and making progression a bit more smooth for uh, the early goings. I mean, one of the biggest reasons why this condition stuff getting pushed back further makes a lot of sense is, I mean, when you look at your tool set at, you know, level five, level six, like it's, it's not very big. You don't have a whole lot of, of things to deal That's with true. things. Um, and plus, I mean, again, like this is the, the combat system. In this is very different than your standard MMO. Uh, you, you know, in those early levels, you're just maybe barely starting to get a grasp on, Oh, I'm not supposed to just stand here and attack everything. I need to use this dodge roll button, you know, moving out of the Move way of a fireball is yeah. possible. Like th- things like that. Like you're still kind of learning those things. And so to stack all of that and then stack, you know, something like fucking confusion on there, it's just not, yeah, it's just not fun. So, good. <laughs> so like I'm all, I'm all for this change. And, and it's not like they're nerfing the entire game where like, you know, oh no, yeah, these skills yeah, are just going to be, you know, shit compared to what they were. It's just, it's pushing it back a little bit. And, yeah. Giving you a chance to kind of, you know, get your, your, your guild wars two lanes. Curve. If you will, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're they're pushing that difficulty curve just a little bit further out. Major, I, 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 I'd like to hear um, your expanded thoughts instead of like having you have to interject over. Here. <laughs> what, what, what are your opinions on this? Uh, I think it's good. I mean, when I played the first beta week with my ranger, I was definitely really frustrated with that Norn area. Some of those missions got really, really hard. Oh yeah, the missions you, were hard. Yeah, just because in Guild Wars two, you can't over level for quests. It, it always skills you down to level the quest. So if you couldn't if you couldn't get something right off the bat, it was like, well, if you're at the quest level or above, it, you know, it's, it's, you're playing it wrong or you don't have a red skill build or something. It's just like trying over and over again with different builds and it got really frustrating. So I'm, I'm yeah, cause you, can, you can't like, if you hit a wall and it was two, you can't go, okay, I'll just go, I'll just yeah, run around. I can't, I can't just level it. another level or two and come back to it and do it. It's you got to figure out some way through it. And I'm glad to hear that they are, uh, Tony down least, a bit. Tony down yeah. a bit. Yes. Yeah. Jim boy, what are your thoughts? I don't know. I like it because um, the combat system in Guild Wars 2 is, I don't want to call it difficult, but if you don't understand how it works, it can be challenging. So the fact that they're it's pushing everything back. Technical. Yeah, yeah, it's technical. So if, you, if you're not used to it, it can be a struggle at first. So with moving all this more difficult, like all more damaging conditions and everything back, they're giving you a chance to learn the combat system and still struggle if you're not doing it right but they're not really punishing you for being a low-level character. As much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tarkin, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I think it's a good idea, but except that I really like having those occasional massive difficulty spike stuff. Yeah. 
screw all you guys. No, I, I'm, I'm totally. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not sure, but the first ten levels is where no, it should be. It was great. It's, I I I felt it was like right on when it, when I played it through my what four. I think I made four. I've made four characters so far, and I felt like pretty much in every area as a hit through, it hit what I wanted to in terms of like difficulty. When I was doing personal story, and I wasn't necessarily doing things like if I, for example, if I stayed still long enough for enemy melee to hit me i went down and i love that i was just like yeah that's this is what i want i want a hard get i want a hard mmo i want to get mmo that's not a frame of fucking kicking my ass and so <laughs> until i figure out hey maybe i shouldn't do that anymore hey maybe i should overcome my like bad habits in these areas so there's something to be said for challenge oh, yeah I, but i, I mean just, let's let's be fair here i mean you did the norn starting area as well there was some of that that yeah. clearly was not balanced like it goes yeah. it goes beyond oh, yeah. just difficulty it, it was a point where I was like, when I did it, I was like, hey, this is pretty challenging. But I got through it. I, I was a necromancer, and I wasn't even a minion master. So I was, I had a pretty hard time of it, but I got through it. And by the, by the time I ended it, I wasn't like, oh, that, that could have been easier. I was like, hell yeah, that was challenging. Until I talked to other people and found that everyone had issues with that area. And then the specific, like, the personal story stuff in the North Study. And then I can say, hey, maybe it's a little bit too difficult. Especially, like, um, so I, I know I'm, I'm well, just, as you can see here, one in five people think that this is a cool thing as it is at stats. <laughs> so, um, I'm a minority in this. But, no, I, I just, yeah, I, for me... As long as they don't, as this, as Duran and you guys pointed out, as long as they don't make it easier throughout the whole game, as as they specifically say here, is only for the starting areas that they're making these change. I guess it's a cool thing. I guess they could like um slowly meter out, especially those more difficult conditions to deal with, like um, confusion and definitely like AOE, for example. They could meter those out a little bit better, perhaps to make it easier for a bunch of other people. But for me, I'm happy with them to leave it as this. Oh, I'm happy for them to make it harder than it is right now. So <laughs> well, yes, and and you know, looking at the again, going back to the. Uh, the world view world um, jumping dungeon, uh, they clearly have no problems making this game difficult. Yeah, that's true. That Th- is they're clearly totally true. okay with that. <laughs> we'll get to that later <laughs> with the ore discussion. Oh yeah, and that's a good time to leap off. So the major discussion this week, um, that that was the news, and as, as I said, there was a bunch more. Um, you, you can probably check out, like for example, Gear Wars Two Guru and a bunch of other news aggregator sites to check out what else happened this week. But those are probably the biggest talking points I wanted to hit. Um, the major to- uh, talk this week though is about a specific thing on Twitch TV that the Arena Net developers put up. Um, it's part of a series, I believe they're starting up called like an Arena Developer Talks, um, or something along those lines. And they they're going to be releasing. They didn't give us a time frame, but we're going to be releasing regular videos um, hitting discussion points uh, for ideas and like things they bring into Guild Wars 2 and highlighting things that maybe a bunch of people don't know about. But this one, though, they actually unloaded a shitload of news. So for this, I'm actually going to load it off to Durin, who made a bunch of um, really nice notes for us to hit for this podcast. So Durin, do you, do you want to run us through the, the first of these topics you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, uh, most of what they're talking about here is basically in-game stuff. They're just talking about, you know, addressing kind of a big concern that a lot of people have with MMO launches, and that is, you know, when I hit level 80, what's next? You know, what do I do? We, I mean, we, we kind of already know there there is no rating in Guild Wars 2, so given that that is kind of the MMO standard, then, you know, obviously people are were a bit worried. You know, Yeah, I'm really excited them? that this was the first one they put out, because this is like one of the major concerns yeah, definitely. for people um, coming into Guild Wars 2, like, especially for a lot of people who are refugees from uh, World of Warcraft with so much endgame content and such an endgame focus. And we'll touch upon that with the stuff they revealed for this. But I just love the fact that they went, hey, we know that there's concerns about this. This is the video we're putting out this week. I think it was yeah. amazing they put it out. Well, and this is a very important thing for them to kind of get out front um, ahead of time because endgame really is what makes or breaks an MMO these days. I mean, a lot yeah. of endgame or a lot of MMOs that launch. You know, don't launch maybe with the end game that the players were anticipating, and that's how an MMO becomes a ghost town a few months down the road. So, it, yeah, like you said, it's definitely yeah, definitely good that they <laughs> brought this out up front. Um, so, going into it, uh, one of the first things they discussed is you know the, the basics. When you hit level eighty, um, you know what do you do? Once you reach level eighty, uh, one of the most important things to note is that you know as you're playing through guild wars you know you you do have a level you do level up when your experience bar fills up you gain a level and with that you gain skill points um once you hit level 80 while you're not gaining a level uh, per se you are still continuing to gain skill points so as you you know tick over from you know full experience bar to empty again you are going to continue gaining those skill points and the skill points are still useful uh even after you have used the roughly 170 skill points to unlock all the abilities for a character um yeah 
those skill points can be redeemed for items um, used in the Mystic Forge for crafting some very you know specific recipes. Um, okay, so yeah, this is this is a point I really wanted. I, I, I found really interesting. So obviously in other games, like in Visual Guild Wars, um, when you ticked, when you hit level twenty, like in this, you're not going to be able to go to level twenty one. Like it'll stop there. And versus this, it's level eighty, so it's more conventional for a lot of other people. But back then, it was level twenty. So when you hit level twenty, you kept gaining skill points. And the reason why that was awesome was that um, to cap, for example, elite skills. Um, I, if you don't know what that means, check out the Guild Wars One wiki, um, or to, or to unlock more characters for your your current character and for your PvP characters. That's what you spent those those skill points on. So having skill points in Guild Wars One was a really good thing, and I love that with the changes in Guild Wars Two, they're still kind of keeping the essence of that, but they're making it all the way even more awesome. Like it, when you take over level eighty now, as Duran said, you're going to get a skill point. But not only could you put that towards skills, like, for example, 170 points, you're going to get 70 from leveling up, starting at level 10. 70, sorry, you're going to get, like, 75 skill points from leveling up. And um, 170 is what you need to unlock all the skills. But if you don't want to do that, you can continue to put them towards other stuff. Like, I think it's freaking cool. Yeah, they, and they did say that yeah. uh, through just kind of playing through the game and, and finding all the skill point challenges and that combined with your normal leveling skills... Um, you can get somewhere around 200 skill points by the time you even hit level 80. Um, wow. Assuming oh, you're wow. doing all those skill point challenges. So clearly there are tons of skill points to get. Definitely more than you're going to need to fill out your character even by the time you hit 80 if you're a completionist. So, Yeah, that's that's really cool. And, and, and again, well, I, I, before I just continue to go in a huge monologue about how awesome I think this is, <laughs> um, New Mage Knight, what, what are your thoughts on this? I like the idea of leveling up to get items. That's kind of interesting. Being able to turn in spare skill points into uh, gear that's useful to you instead of just being able to sort of sitting with your skill bubble forever and that all the experience you get not having to go to anything. Yeah, yeah and exactly. it should probably be noted too that like, you know, you don't have to wait until level 80 to do this stuff. If there's something that you're trying to do and you maybe, you know, you don't need something for whatever build you're going for anytime soon. Oh, you can, you can do the Mystic Forge stuff before level 80? I believe, uh, yeah, I believe it's, so. It's level 30. I've thrown, I yeah. threw weapons in it in the last beta. Well, can, so. you, can you turn spirit, skill points into uh, weapons before level 80? That we don't know. Question. I'm yeah. pretty yeah. sure they mentioned that during the video, but I'd have to go back and watch it to, to verify that. Either way. Well, I, I think it would make sense they do, but if they, if they hold it off to 80, that's I think fine. that's all. So, yeah, it's still yeah. fine. That's still yeah. Fine. So the next thing they noted. Shimboing? Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I actually don't want to move on from this point for a bit because okay, there's, okay. there's there's a point there's a point that uh, Mage and I talked about there that I definitely want to talk about. But um, Shimboy, what what are your overarching thoughts about this? I don't know. I'm curious what they're going to do with the Mystic Forge stuff because if you're trading in skill points, is it just going to spit a random item at you, or are you going to be able to pick what you want if you're going for a specific recipe? I, that's good. I believe the wording question. they used was purchase, so I think you're actually picking. Yeah, you're picking. Okay, that's that. that's really awesome. Then that's a great yeah. idea. Tarkin. I'm with Shin Boy. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> <idea. laughs> the fact that you can you actually purchase specific stuff and not random stuff. Exactly, because it's, the stuff yeah, you really get now cool. from the Mystic Forge is just like random junk. It's yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So the first time I used the Mystic Forge, I got a rifle for my guardian, and I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I can't use a rifle. <laughs> but I mean, I see, yeah, you see, you see nice like maze for for ten points, and you're gonna. Like build your way up to that maze, and that's like a, a, good, a nice goal for the end game, which is probably a good idea. It might people be people focused on. I, I hope it's usable stuff like that. So, so to to slow this down a little bit, we've got. So when you hit eighty, you get, you get those skill points, and you obviously keep gaining them by doing stuff like more dynamic events, um, completing the end game, going back to the starter areas, and redoing stuff like that with your friends, for example, will continue to net you skill points because obviously it's just tied to the level up system. So anytime you get XP, you're essentially building up towards these items. So once you have that, once you have skill points and you have any sitting around, whether it's eighty or before eighty, there's going to be an NPC next to the Mystic Forge who will actually prompt you. It sounds like as if he was like a karma vendor or anything else um, for exchange with those skill points for items. And the two they hit on specifically was crafting items, I believe. And they, they, I believe, I'm almost certain they specifically call those out as things you can trade for. Like obviously, there'd be rare crafting items because a skill point is going to be hard to come by. You obviously, that could be really up. nice. Yeah, the wording yeah, they, the wording they for, used for, was for crafters. the wording they used was was crafting items for specific recipes. Ah, yeah, so that, like, there's that too as well. So I, I think I think they actually said. Oh. Anyway, either way, the ne- the other part of it is perhaps more exciting. We'll hit it up just in a second. But there's going to be unique like kind of things you only get by trading skill points for them, um, and those would be like specific stuff that is used for recipes 
in the Mystic Forge. So for those who don't know what the Mystic Forge is, it's a thing in Lion's Arch, which is one of the major cities in Guild Wars 2, which you walk up to it, you can throw in four random items or any items you want to, and it'll spit up a a, a specific... Well, not a specific, but like a magical item of a specific level, depending on what you threw in the first place. So that's what most people use it for. If you have junk that you pick up in game, you can't really find it uh, any use for it by trading on the trading post or for any of your other characters. You can just chuck into the Mystic Forge. If you put in four magical items, you're certain to get a magic item back, whether it'll be better than what you put in or not, I'm not certain with. But either way, that's the basic usage of it. But what they're also doing is having recipes. Now, there's a couple points I want to hit here before, I, before we move on, but... There's going to be recipes for the Mystic Forge. And what that means is if you put in a specific combination of four items or maybe less, I can think, I think you can put in less as well. Now, Tarkin, did you try this out? No, I didn't. It needs okay, to be so four items, I'm pretty sure. Because I, I right. missed it a lot with just junk I picked up. Yeah, so, so you can you put in the four items and if you put in a specific combination of those four items, you're going to get a specific item out. And so this is a kind of like Final Fan- almost Final Fantasy-esque thing where if you... Uh, I, I'm sure... I, I don't know why I pulled the, that reference out. I think there's one of the Final Fantasies that d- does this. But essentially, you put in a, um, four specific things and you get something really awesome in return. That, that could be like a, the mystical black die of awesomeness, for example. Or it could be um, a legendary item. Let's, let's just move on to the next topic. Hey, we? what's the legendary weapon? <laughs> what's that? <laughs> so it turns out there's going to be more. legendary weapons in Guild Wars 2. Um Legendaries are player crafted, uh, require a lot of components from different, um, different activities around the game. A lot of the components, um, are not items that can be purchased from players. So they're, they're things that you're actually going to have to go out and earn yourself, which is really cool, I think. Um, probably one of the most important things about legendaries, and I believe this was the case in Guild Wars 1, is that the legendaries aren't, are not any more powerful than the top exotic, uh, weapons in the game. So they're more of an aesthetic, th- um, thing. Um, they, they mentioned a few of them in the, uh, the video. Uh, there's a, there's a bow that has a unicorn head on the front of it that I believe (laughs) the arrows shot from it have rainbow trails. (laughs) And that pretty much sounds awesome. Well, pre-order confirmed. (laughs) Found found my new pulling bow. Awesome. (laughs) Uh, there's a, there's a juggernaut helm or hammer, um, that looks like it has like a ball of liquid inside of it. It'll make your armor actually look like kind of, I believe they, they described it like melt, melting liquid. They made a comparison to uh, the t- uh, Terminator. Terminator. I, I think what they yeah. meant was 2000. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it'll actually cause you to leave like, it sounds like liquid metallic footprints behind you. And that. That's pretty that's, cool. Of the three, four that they talked about, that's probably the second coolest one. Um, yeah. Second coolest. Second coolest. No, third. third that's four, fourth. There's so many okay. awesome ones. Go on. Yeah. So the the <laughs> last bit they talked about were a, a set of great swords. There's two great swords that you can get. Um, one, the blade looks like the night sky. The other one, the blade looks like the day sky. And those are both legendary weapons that you would have to craft. Um, and the unique thing about those, and I, from the sounds of it, this is the only one that's like this, um, is that you can take those two great swords and craft another epic that, or another legendary that I imagine is even harder than to get even beyond just having those two swords. Uh, that then the blade of that great sword will actually change based on the time of day in game. Oh man, hmm. that great sword sounds pretty oh, great, man. right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that is a great I sword. One hundred percent intended. <laughs> I said that before the podcast as well, and I wasn't amused then either. <laughs> <laughs> don't hate. That don't was hate the worst. You don't have puns. You don't have puns like I have puns. <laughs> Um, I thought it was funny. It's, 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 it's so moving on from what I was saying before. So some of the things you use trade those skill points in for are the unique things that you can throw into the Mystic Forge to get to get these, these items, awesome legendary hmm. items. And and these are only what this is a short bow, I believe it is a hammer and three great swords. And obviously by having three great sword legendaries, they're kind of confirming there'll be even more for the other weapon types. There's going to be I'm sure. a be crap a load of re- legend. Yeah. Yeah, but guard for each one that's pretty it's a lot of art it's a lot of interesting new effects they might have to add in yeah maybe there won't be that many i don't know maybe oh uh, maybe well there'll, there'll definitely be like some terms the of same like amount some yeah i imagine yeah. there would be at least and they'll one probably patch in more of course yeah yeah oh, i'm sure there'll be one of everything but... yeah there'll have to be one of everything I'm, I'm gonna get my hands all over that legendary rifle whatever it is <laughs> but whatever means i have to go through whatever bitches i have to kill 
where we do that freaking dominate in PvP or whatever it is <laughs> to get that legendary rifle. I will do so, friends, to get that legendary. I'm, I'm look dominating people this. at PvP from what I've heard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't talk to talk. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> so, uh, do we know where these like, special like ingredients come from? Do we know the like dungeons or, or like quests or what? It sounds like the way they described it, they said that the, uh, the ingredients necessary to, to craft these are going to come from uh, different uh, different things throughout the game. So it sounds like you're going to have so to maybe, maybe even PvP. Yeah, you may have to do some PvP. You may have to do some dungeons. You may need to do some dynamic events. You know, it's going to be all over the game. And, and the, uh, that makes sense. I mean, these things shouldn't be super easy to get. And they should be a lot of work you have to put in, which I think goes along with that idea of this stuff being what I imagine is basically, you know, uh, player bound so that you can't just go on the trade yeah. trading post and just go buy all it's, these parts. It should almost certainly be. If it's not player bound, they made a mistake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in this. Like, for me, a lot of the, the end game of a memo is loot loss. Like, that's what drives me is, is numbers going up. Yeah. So, uh, the fact they have the same stats as, as super rare weapons, it, I kind of wish they had better stats, but I can see why they would wouldn't make that. Yeah, that's, it's just not the, the effects way alone to have them have better stats. I, I'm, I could see myself maybe putting some in some extra time to try to get a nicer looking weapon, but I don't know. Really? I mean, I'm sure. I yeah, like I. Unless, like, if I if I randomly found a really exotic weapon and then I was thinking looking at the, the the legendary equivalent, if it wasn't a lot of extra time, I'm not sure if I would do it. Well, I will they say, look cool, but I will say as as, as somebody who who has you know played a fair bit of WoW, um, I'm totally okay with trading off the better stats than other gear with the, the ability gear? with the ability to, to actually get it myself, not have to rely oh, on do it yourself. a yeah. ten or twenty five main raid to do it. Is it the, the, I'm sure the exotic stuff is all random, whereas the stuff is uh, you know obviously obtainable. It's through through hard work, and that that could be pretty compelling. Yeah. Now, one well, question I do have is: you said that this was in. I believe you had said before, uh, setting that these these legendary weapons similar to this were in Guild Wars One, correct? No, no, it wasn't nope. that. Uh, so well, it was I, it was I, rare I was skins. Yeah, much. so I have a bunch of things to kind of say here. So the one thing is, they they've kind of soft announced two levels of items here. So there's legendary items. But there's also going to be exotic items. And what exotic items are, as I've said here, is uh, max stat. So set max stats. And it sounds like there's going to be set exotic items that you can get, which you get through difficult, like, explorable mode dungeons, um, specific crafting combinations in the Mystic Forge, and, uh, like, a bunch of, like, hard stuff to do to get these exotic weapons. And so that a big point I was actually saying in the way that this is like it was one is, no matter what, in Guild Wars, across both games... In the end game, the ultimate goal is for everyone to be mechanically equal. So, in terms of P- WoW well versus world, structured PvP, whatever it is, the one of the core tenets of Arena is once you actually get to end game, it shouldn't be a case where person people who put in more time are actually going to be better than people who didn't put in much time. Now, of course, there's positive and negatives. That so some people would think, like Mage and I said, if this isn't going to give me a mechanical advantage, why would I necessarily put in the time for it? And that's a very valid way of looking at things. But from my perspective being a person who's really into pvp hopefully when they eventually put in tdm that's going to be a thing and then world versus world i i I love the fact that they're keeping it such that legendary items in this game won't actually give you a statistical advantage but either way exotic items are something interesting and new that i haven't heard of like for example they've already confirmed that merchants at top level like level 80 will be setting selling just straight up items with max stats on them but the fact Hmm. that you're also going to get like these really cool exotic items made by really doing different little stuff, not even which is more attainable than a legendary. Let's just say um, that's also exciting to me. Um, so, so we're gonna have point. we're gonna have top, Go top like top stat items and then exotic items and then legendary yep. items. Oh, okay, wow. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, it's gonna be great. It's, I can't. Just what, what, are you, what are your reactions to that? Um, while you might not have a mechanical advantage, these things make you more visible. That is true. It's yeah. just you saying like, "Hey, I've I've mastered this game. Look at my awesome freaking oh, yeah. day and night sword." Like, yeah. <laughs> so if you walk into this world, people are gonna target you first because hey, <laughs> yeah. they're both rainbows. Make sure, or <laughs> make sure you make sure you hide your rainbow bow in world of world. Or you know, everyone will go for you first. Maybe maybe they won't because they'll see that you clearly have played a shit ton of this game. Oh yeah, and <laughs> you oh, know man. your character, and that that, that dude that dude's armor is moving. Stay away from that. Guy. Yeah, and, and I think in this game more than a lot of other MMOs, the idea of you know your character means a lot more because they are kind of balancing everything around you know, everybody having kind of the same max stats or whatever. So it really comes down to player skill then. Yeah. So, you know, so what this actually reminds me of something. Sorry, 
to interrupt, but um, like this reminds me of title grinding in Guild Wars One. Uh, it's like it's a purely aesthetic thing. Yes, but people will invest a lot of time and a lot of effort in doing it. So, it, and this is even more more like cool looking than a title, is my opinion. Is you get a, a cool like thing for your efforts. It's interesting yeah. that they went for um, and legendary weapons instead of legendary armors. Like in the original Guild Wars, one of the things was. Um, Fissure of Woe armor, and like, like I think that was it. A Whoa. bunch of like end game prestige armors that you put for your character. Do we know if there's end game armor? Like we don't know. Armor? We have no there, idea. I, no, they've only talked about weapons, but I assume there must be armor. Well, too. there's the there's the armor sets from the uh, explorable modes of the dungeons. Uh, the one question though I had about those was like, say for the Ascon Catacombs, you can still obviously do the explorable mode of that dungeon if you're level eighty. Are you going to out level the gear that you get from the tokens from that dungeon? Yes. Because if I so, then there's so. really only like a. What? How many level eighty dungeons are there? Like three? eight. And eight? There's only yeah. There was fewer than that. But there was. Uh, no, we'll we'll like, get to that yeah. in, the, in just a bit. Yeah. Okay. But with the but, no, you're system, right because um you get what, the, yeah, exactly the looks. Yeah, as as Darkin's saying. So essentially, um, when by by completing Asclon Catacombs normal uh story mode, you actually end the dungeon and everyone gets the same piece of armor. It's like a helm. Yeah, that's it's a specific a, skin. A yeah, and the reason they do that is because by completing in explorable mode, you're going to be able to get the other pieces of that armor to complete the armor set. Um, the fact that that's a level thirty or thirty-five dungeon, that's actually that armor set at the end is going to be wearable by anyone who can put who can complete that dungeon. So you'll be it'll be scaled to level thirty-five, I assume. But as Tarkin's pointing out here, and I believe this will also be the case. Like they haven't said whether it is or not, but I believe this is also be the case for the legendary weapons. All of these items are going to be transmutable, which means if you like the skin from the awesome set of armor you get by completing Axel- Axelon Catacombs Explorable Mode, you can take the purchasable max stat armor you can get from a merchant and put those stats on the skin by a transmission. That's a good point, now. too. Yeah. I forgot about that, because I was going to say, if there's only a small handful of level 80 dungeons, that severely limits the gear you can use, at least armor-wise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Duran, you, you had something to say when, when you heard about exotic, legendary, and so on and so forth. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one question I had is kind of pertaining to, back to Guild Wars 1. Um, when, when, they, when they launched new, new content, um, was there like a new tier of equipment that came along with that? Or how, how nope. was equipment handled? Okay, so equipment basically just new static. skins. Okay, okay. So the stats stay the same. It's just new skins available for it. Yeah. Okay, that, ma- that, that makes a lot more sense because I was wondering how they were going to handle um the legendaries because like in again like going back to to wow the way they do their legendaries is they are kind of you know they use item level um for determining kind of the stats that go on there um and the one problem you run into with legendaries is if you get it during the content it is appropriate for it's amazing and it's awesome and you're super cool for having it new expansion comes out and suddenly it's being replaced and now your legendary is not so legendary anymore just to slow you down for a second, I, I believe because the reason I made this, the these two pieces, essentially two pieces of news, the whole discussion topic for this week was because there's a really interesting thing to talk about and how, how Guild Wars approaches legendary items and end game kind of content versus WoW. I, I'd love it for you to, because I've, I've read a lot about it and I, it found, it sounds just absolutely crazy to me. Can you, can you outline how WoW, for example, does legendary items? Because I heard there's things like only one person in a raiding party can get it. Like what, what, what do you need to outline to me about it works? Yeah, so the, basically the way it generally ends up working out is if you have, um, you, you'll have a, a legendary item that generally requires a, so, some pieces to be uh, acquired, and they are um, bind on pickup, so once the player gets that item, they can't just trade it to somebody else. Um, and so generally what happens with a raid group is they, they pick somebody uh, to be kind of the first recipient of the legendary item, and generally the legendary items also are specific to a class. So like this is the only class or maybe these are the only two classes maybe they can use them. Um, and so you'll pick kind of the per- the main person or the first person to get it and everybody goes into the raid, does the raid, you you know, do what you can to obtain the item, you obtain the item and you do this week after week after week until you have all the items you need to craft or to create basically to do. Generally they have like a quest line associated to it uh, that is usually a solo quest line um, to then, you know, do all of that and eventually get your item. And so, like you said, one person out of the raid group gets that legendary item. And then once that person finally has theirs, then they might work on the, the next person getting it. And so, like, what the fuck? through the course of the, <laughs> the, the, 
lifespan of the content, you'll eventually get it so that everybody who can use that legendary can get it. But again, only certain classes can use certain legendaries. What? So, and there's only one legendary generally released in in a uh, content update. With with no more usually than what two maybe I don't I don't know that they've released three in one expansion. Um, but I will say, <laughs> with uh, Mists of Pandaria, they're introducing something um, that might sound a little familiar, and that is a legendary that everybody can get. That uh, is a kind of a, a long quest line that is completely soloable. You do it by yourself, and when you're done, you pick the one you want that is appropriate for your class. Oh, hey, hey, that, that, that's, that's the original. Easy. <laughs> yeah, so that's how they're going to handle the one in Mists of Pandaria. Because they've had a lot of complaints from players, they're like, hey, you know, when does my class get a legendary? Well, no shit. That is the worst system I've ever freaking heard. So what is, is that legendary, like, the best weapon for that class? Is that, like, raid level gear? Pretty, Pocket yeah, it's, it's basically, like I said, they use item level for determining the stats on the gear, and it's generally, like, above whatever the current um, tier of rating is, and generally mm-hmm. will last that person through the expansion. Interesting. But again, like I said, the issue there then is that because Blizzard is kind of in the, the market of um, obsoleting their content when they release a new, uh, n- you know, new major content update or, an, uh, God forbid, a new expansion, uh, when that new expansion comes out, that legendary is really no longer viable. Like Thunder Fury was the one exception um, that t- because of just how the, the, the item was itemized, people were able to use it for so long. Um, and that was that was one of the legendaries from the original vanilla wow um but aside from that like you know you get a legendary in burning crusade and when lich king came out it was i mean there were epics that were better i wonder how arena is going to deal with that i wonder if they're going to make it scale up if they're going to make just like this is the top level of weapon forever and you're just going to kind of get more variants or if it's going to be like well that's why i was asking cynic about how they handled it in Guild Wars one and so it sounds like basically stat wise the gear is probably going to stay the same all the way through once you hit level 80 going forward mm-hmm. into other content updates it's just that they're going to add more skins and probably more legendaries as well so that you're not just using not that sure same legendary that. all the way through i don't know i yeah. like that system because like in the first guild of rose of cynic for a sword say it was what 15 to 22 was the, what, the mm-hmm. damage range and Pretty it was from that. that from release day until today it's still that same number so exactly. you can find a random like say you're in nightfall and you find a random blue that has an inscription slot you can set that up with the same exact modifications and stats as the rarest skin gold weapon and it'll be just as good just the gold one depending where you got it from might have a rarer skin and be worth more yeah i just like to think that rare equals mechanically better i guess i kind of have to break myself of that habit well it's it's actually i like the fact that it's just skins yeah like like, again you know coming from wow i actually like this this method because then it makes the legendary like kind of mean something because that legendary once you finally get that like that will always be amazing it's not going to get suddenly mm-hmm. yeah. like just made obsolete because they decided to release another expansion. Yeah, like, all that work you did is just completely for fucking. I'm still nothing reeling they for so that's okay. So for, in WoW, you're looking at 25 or so people putting weeks worth of effort to get a single legendary for like one or two of them. I want to say that this uh, this most current one uh, was a uh, set of rogue daggers, um, and it took about a month of raiding to get all of the the. Um, stuff you needed that to shit start is the question. Fucked, and and so compare that to this is where I wanted to bring this up. As, as Shane Boy said, um, in original Guild Wars, from the first release of Guild Wars to the final run of Guild Wars One, they never raised the level cap. So level twenty was the top level you can hit to in in the original Guild Wars, and by the end of Nightfall, sorry, the end of Eye of the North level 20 was still dead so it's very likely that the same will transfer to guild wars 2 and level 80 will always be the level cap um the ra- the reason that's cool is because essentially as the expansions went on skill became more and more of a thing because instead of being more powerful to adjust to the new content you actually had to be better at the game the longer the ex- like the more expansions came out because some of the end game content in the hard mode dungeons and like the hard mode stuff was like pretty much geared still for those level 20 dudes that you got from playing the original Guild Wars. So it was like a really great set of endgame stuff and we'll get to that stuff later but yeah. the point I wanted to make Can here I add something is... to this real quick? Yeah, sure. Instead of like say upgrading um, you know, new legendary gear increasing the amount of damage your weapons did, the way they did it in the first game and I can see this doing this here too is they added more skills so you could only use certain skills if you unlock them in that new campaign so i could see oh, them yeah, transferring yeah. that too 
Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, so, and, and again, coming from a game that d- does the kind of add levels, add levels, add levels with new expansions, that sounds awesome because, like, guess what's not fun? Getting the new expansion <laughs> and being forced to play, you know, to level up through leveling content for five more levels just so I can use these new skills. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, as I said earlier, the it would be geared towards the same level and the same... Um, well, the difficulty will be increasing because they're expecting higher player skill because it's been out for longer. But as Shinbo says, as new expansions come out, and they've already confirmed it for Guild Wars 2, you find new elites, new skills for each class, and that kind of stuff is what they'll be drip feeding. But the, the reason I brought that into here is the fact that the legendary items in the original Guild Wars will stay awesome legendary, as Durin said, is absolutely fantastic for future content. I, I hope, I assume, that they'll be keeping the same methodology for Guild Wars 2. And I love the fact, just to move on from there, because we are we are getting time, I think the, the major point I want to hit here is that you can do these by yourself from the start. Like Which straight is great, up. yeah. yeah. Now, one real, just real quick question I had about what you were talking about, um, about kind of how they handled the new content and stuff in Guild Wars 1. Um, did they, because they basically made it so that as new expansions came out, it basically got harder and harder and your skill mattered more and more, was there ever a concern of like a player hitting a skill wall and therefore not really wanting to buy the new content because they they couldn't even basically beat the content they had? Uh, no, not really. Nothing was really that. I mean, like the way they had it, they had it split into normal mode and hard mode. Yeah. So I mean, you could okay. get through normal mode if like quite easily with just the uh, the It wasn't necessarily NPCs. easy. Like it definitely got harder. Oh yeah, it was it never challenging, but point. it was never. Yeah. You never hit a brick wall. Okay. Yeah, okay. It, it seemed as if they they just they hit the, just the right combination of slightly harder but still perfectly achievable by most people. That I never got to the point where I think anyone complained about something being too hard. It was that maybe in the original Guild Wars where pretty much every every major mission except for perhaps Thunderhead Keep you you could do by the the first time through, right? In normal mode, difficulty. In Guild Wars, yeah. as, as it kind of exp- hit expansions, maybe a lot of people would have to maybe do. A like a Kurzik mission, some of the Kurzik missions out there, one or two times before they got it down and got through it. But everyone was able to do it. Like they just Eternal Grove. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like everyone was just able to to get through it in the end. And that's not talking about hard mode, but yeah, yeah. Arena has just proved themselves time and time again, and in terms of when it comes to like supported content as the game goes on. And that's screen they made over. it too easy. I don't know because like especially when the the fun times that were uh, Shadow Form. When that was first, <laughs> like, you were making it through the quote unquote elite areas in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes if you had a good team consistently. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, either way, that, that's, that's again, like something that is, is something that it happens pretty much every game. Like, as soon as you hit people who get the patterns down, who get like the skill usage down and what skills they need to optimize for an area, that's going to happen. And it's kind of interesting that it's there for people who want to seek that out in the original Guild Wars. And I assume it'll be there for people who want to seek out those speedrun kind of mentalities in Guild Wars 2. I, I actually think that's pretty good that they were able to keep it that way. But anyway, um, I, yeah, so as I said earlier, what do you guys feel that you can essentially do all of this by yourself. Like, for example, um, to the point where you can't actually trade a lot of these recipe ingredients to be able to get any of these legendaries. You actually have to earn them yourself by using those skill points, by doing those um, dynamic events by yourself to actually do them. What, what are you guys' thoughts? Duran? I like it. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, am I going? Is Duran going? Who's going? Okay. Uh, Shinboy, um, go ahead. Shinboy, go ahead. I like it because it prevents people from just, since they have the whole gem system in there, just people buying all the ingredients for the, for the legendary Absolutely. weapons and essentially buying the weapons. I like that you have yeah. to earn it yourself. Yeah, th- they should definitely be things that you put a lot of time and effort into. Yeah, like it, it's, you know, given how unique these things are going to be, it, it'll be really cool because, like, you can know, like, when you see somebody with that day night sword, like, that dude, he put the effort into that. He didn't just slide oh, yeah. his credit card, he didn't go and, and you know, hit up the trading post like he actually spent the hours to get that and that's really cool so how do you guys feel like i I, I, first i want to say that the idea of two legendaries being fused into a third legendary but a just for looks and b just for prestige is great to me like the fact that they go hey like they've they've stated in the interview this is going to be the hardest one to get like already they're they're announcing us right now yeah if you see someone this they're they're fucking crazy but i'd love how 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 do you guys feel of that being your end game, like goal point? Do you, do you feel that this is like satisfying for you, Duren? Again? Yeah, I, I actually, you know, um, 
you know, because I, I don't really have the time for things like raiding and, and stuff like that. Like, I think I could see myself, you know, with having World v. World and Legendary Item Obtaining, like, that being my end game, And I would be totally happy with that. That's awesome. Tarkin, what, what, I, you have, you've been pretty quiet on this one. What, do, what are your feel, thoughts here? Is he it's here? a good idea that you have to <laughs> <laughs> work for it. Um... And so yeah, you, you find it was a good idea. Deviation there to work from it, the yeah. original Guild Wars one, where you could actually buy the things and not actually have to earn the components required. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. You can't just buy them like off another players. Yeah, uh, the original Guild Wars, you had a lot of. I'm, I'm not sure if you can trade the legendaries themselves. Now that's different. I'm not sure if you can actually trade those. I doubt. I doubt you. In Guild Wars two, like, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I doubt you would have to do all this work yourself, and then just be able to buy it from another player if you didn't feel like doing the work yeah exactly like why would they make all of these components um need to be obtained by the player if they're then going to let you just sell the legendary yeah it definitely that wouldn't make any sense I'm, I'm, I'm almost certainly is buy on player that's interesting well I, I i hope they keep it by on player i, I don't know what they're going to do i'm not sure what how do other mmos approach this do they do they ever let you sell a legendary for example in, to no actually in wow um legendaries are always buying on, on pickup um, and on top of it, with their, their transmogrification system where they let you change the skin of stuff, Legendary is the only um, tier of gear that is excluded from that. You cannot transmog something to look like a Legendary, and you cannot transmog a Legendary to look like something else. Right. And, and this, it's an interesting point, because in this one, they've announced that the Legendaries will be based on exotics. Like, they'll, they'll be picking an exotic and improving that to make the Legendary skin of it, at least in terms of stats. So, for example, in the original Guild Wars, the exotics in inverted commas, or the greens, as we just called it back then, um, it's, I, I know for some WoW players, I think green is not necessarily a good level of skill. But anyway... In Guild Wars 1, <laughs> green was the top level tier of items. And um, they was a unique, so they had a unique skin. And so what those were was like, for example, if you're a warrior who really wanted um, to gain energy on a hit, and, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry, you don't need to know about that in Guild Wars 2. <laughs> but um, there was a specific... I miss energy. Oh, I miss energy as well. There's a specific kind of... There's a specific axe, for example, um, a specific exotic that gave you the max stats with the cool skin for that style of play. And um, so there was a bunch of like exotic and very common unique axes in Guild Wars 2, but you'd be aiming for that specific one for your play style. Um, I, I find it interesting that they've already announced that there's specific, very specific skins for legendaries, and I don't believe they'll be as f abundant as exotics. So my main question is, what are you guys' thoughts are the pros probabilities of you being able to use transmutation stones to actually put in the stats you want into your legendary? I actually think the probability is pretty high. Shinboy, what are your thoughts? Uh, I hope they do it because, I mean, even if it's max damage, it might not have, you know, the modifiers that I want, like increased precision or power or whatever. So I'd yeah. like to be able to customize the stats of it. Exactly. And, and Durin, uh, did, were, they, you, were there things as equivalent to that? Were there specific play styles attached to a weapon? Or did you, in, in WoW, did you pretty much say, hey, this is the best weapon, and it pretty much applies to the entire class? Like, how they work? Could, could you even modify it like this? Um, well, you couldn't modify them in any way whatsoever. That's another um, feature they did add in uh, Cataclysm was the ability to uh, reforge gear to kind of change stats on it. Um, change certain stats, like secondary stats, to be other ones to make them more valuable for your class, and I believe you cannot do that with Legendary either. Um, but they did make them so that they were, I mean, if it was a hunter bow, um, it was pretty much good for all hunters. I, I am fairly certain. Right. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely see, for example, in this game, if they keep in like the Doom modifier, which is when you switch to a weapon, it, the next attack with it does 30% more damage, like that kind of stuff, having builds created around Doom, I, I, I really see them having the legendaries customizable because they're the people who want to be able to use the legendary as part of the basic WVW gear, for example. Um, so I, I really do hope that they'll be keeping the transmutation ability of these weapons. Um, Mage Knight, what are your thoughts here? Well, it would be nice if you can try the and stats, but I, I assume they will probably be empirically the best. I, yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> I yeah, mean, it's I possible mean. they won't be, but... Nope. <laughs> it just be like I mean, little modifiers like that that you'll probably see the, the changes. Yeah. I mean, it could be like small... I mean, it'd be nice to modify the stats, but I'm not sure if they'll let you transmute it at all. I'm sure they'll, they'll completely ban it from coming in near transmutation stones. For the exact same reason that Durin mentioned earlier, yeah, maybe. But I, if, well, if the weapons can count bound, then you kind of don't have the problem of people making it look like legendary because you've already earned a legendary, right? 
Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I think yeah. that it's it's a bit different too in Guild Wars 2 because like in WoW, your gear is pretty much everything. I mean, knowing your class to a certain extent is obviously very helpful. Um, but if you're doing just basic raiding, it's all about the gear. Whereas with Guild Wars 2, it's kind of the opposite. So like in, in WoW, it makes sense because those, those stats need to be you know unique to that. And it is the most powerful. And that's why you don't want you know somebody making a sword that is lesser than the le- uh, legendary one look like a legendary just to make you look stronger. Um, but in Guild Wars 2, because it is, you know, the same level as an exotic item, if you were to change, you know, the stats to be that of a different exotic item, it's still, when it comes down to it, not any more powerful than an exotic item. Right. Just to go against the grain here, I'm thinking it will be exempt from the transmutation system. Ooh, why? Only <laughs> because of how the crafting system is set up. In the crafting you system, you can add in different items to generate different stats for your weapon, for your items. So I'm thinking, in the generation of this, you'll add in specific items to give you different stats. Oh, so like so different like one sets might of um, focus recipes on for the same power. Weapon. Another might focus on precision, stuff like that. That's a because good point too. So you, you, the, you like, customize the legendary. Yeah, okay, I can see that. As you create it, yeah. I think it's terrible, I hate you. <laughs> no, actually, that, that totally makes sense because I mean that that gives you you know multiple different um, recipes for the legendary, and that you can pick what the one the that works best shifts? for you. What have they nerfed Doom? <laughs> <laughs> then you're shit out of luck. Go get another legendary. <laughs> that's, that's the reason. That's the major like reason. I, I think that's it's an interesting point, and, and I think I wanted to hit on that just before we move on because we're talking about legendaries for a while now. But um, I. Guild Wars is, is a PvP fo- like two of the three segments of Guild Wars 2. One's PvE and two of the three is PvP. So they're structured in this world versus world. I, I think that the fact that they know that metas are going to shift, for example, um, means that they're probably going to let you transmute, at least customize this after completing them to some extent. Um, even though that you may be right. like I, I, It'd be an interesting system if they do say, hey, these are going to be locked in, so maybe you want to f- um, find a modifier which is perhaps um, one that's less situational, one that might not be as nerfed. Like, for example, um, reducing or giving you might on a weapon swap would be something that's pretty like standard across all weapons. You, don't, you pretty much always want that, even though might's not the best of them. But anyway, um, that's <laughs> interesting. I do want to put, touch on one last thing in, in the fact that um, these are based on recipes, right, for the Mystic Forge. Right. And what they've said from the start is that they're not actually going to release the recipes for items. They're going to let users oh. find them themselves. So um, you have to experiment? Yeah, or, pretty much. Or will it be like recipes in the world where you, you come across a page with it's has something written on it? That's exactly my question. So the side of this is if you're going to ask users to experiment to get these legendary items, how much time of theirs are you going to waste if you don't give them some way to find the the recipes in the world? Like, Shinbo, what do you thought? How do you think they're going to approach this? I think I'm going to wait to do any of this until it's all up on the wiki. Yeah, pretty (laughs) much. Yeah, seriously. Like, by the time we do get to level 80, I assume it will be on the wiki somewhere. Yeah, it'll it'll be data mined somewhere. Oh, I'll be down to mind. That that's true. Like I don't see anyone yeah. actually doing these by accident ever. So I I, I think that would be so that the cool whole, if, like, if you could though. <laughs> like just accidentally coming across a legendary because you threw some shit into the Mystic Forge. Like that'd be awesome. That'd be interesting. That would be cool. But I think I it's know, a I bit can much see them doing something here. different. Yeah, we are in the world of the internet, see, so that's not going to happen. I can see them doing something where it's like on the bottom of the item it says ingredient four X legendary weapon, and it only lets you add those ingredients together. Okay, that could that actually could be int- actually fully be appreciative of that. Um, yeah, like a little note on the bottom. Do you think they I would do that, even- or do you think they would just do like maybe you know component for legendary item? Like, don't say what it's for, but component for legendary yeah, item. That works you get too. four components, throw them in the Mystic Forge, and see what you get. I don't know. I feel like that would kind of suck because if I'm a warrior and I get like a weapon that I can't use, then what the hell did I spend all this time on? You're well, going to make yeah. a character. Yeah, which I was going to say, if, if, they, if they make an account <laughs> bound and you can just send it to one of your other characters. Or trade it to one of your good guild mates. Well, no, because I hope they oh, make you can't trade it. Oh, yeah, you can buy a pickup, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. That's that Wait, is a positive negative. But I actually I prefer the hmm. idea of um, if there's like a specific 
cave that's a specific weird jump in a weird floating jumping puzzle in the Asura Lands that can kind of maybe you can get if you just do it just right and at the end of that cave is a wall which just tells you what parts you'll need to make a specific weapon <laughs> I, I, I prefer that kind of weird obscure way of doing like um, like just have the hints, recipes yeah. in the world oh yeah right there's, there's an NPC episode. that tells you there's an NPC that tells you but he only spawns during certain hours oh, yeah stuff like that do that That'd be cool. You can do all of that, and then he's not there. Like if you come there at night, and the moon hits this co- the top of the cave just right, it comes through <laughs> and hits a wall, and it spawns an NPC that tells you that'd be awesome. So it. only that'd on so nights cool. of a full moon. <laughs> yeah, that'd be and awesome. Then the, uh, no, see the, the painting the, from Prometheus where they're all looking at the skies on there. <laughs> no, see the, the problem with that idea, cynic, is that again, kind of going back to WoW, they have had things like that where NPC, like one NPC, sells this very rare, unique item or whatever. Um, and, and the item is kind of on a long respawn. And what you end up getting is you, you get people that will just sit there and camp the thing over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. And so, like, yeah. that just wouldn't, like, you would literally have people just standing around that area all the time trying to get that item. And it just wouldn't be fun. Uh, it's, that's different to them exposing a recipe because in the end, it'll be awesome for the people who want to do it all in in-game context, but it's also available on the wiki 10 minutes later for people who don't, can't be bothered. True. I think your your original idea of, like, you know, like you said, this crazy jumping puzzle that it takes you a while and you get there and there's just a wall there with the recipe yeah. kind of written on yeah. the wall, like, actually built into the environment, that would be really cool. Yeah, exactly. I, I would love to see stuff like that. And, and I hope it's not stuff like you need five of these, two of these, and one of those, right? I hope <laughs> it's, like, you actually need... Uh, unique combinations of those skill point items or end game like um event chain items and stuff like that to get these legendaries not just multiples of a specific like uh denomination of some rare item like ectos like i, I hated the whole you need 30 ectos or whatever it is to make a rare armor in the first guild wars I, I hope it's like actual like unique items that combine in specific different ways it'd be cool Anyway, and with that, uh, we can round out the legendary discussion. Durin, do you want to take us to finally the next topic um, on the from that uh, developer video on Twitch TV? Yeah, we touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but one of the first things they really brought up, um, kind of going along with the uh, you know level eighty, you know the the, the level cap thing and, and continuing to gain skill points. Um, along with that, they talked about basically they. They really want you to, um, they don't want you to play a different game at level 80 than you've been playing as you've been leveling. So kind of what they mean by that is you've been doing, um, you know, uh, dynamic events and renowned hearts and things like that as you have been leveling up and, and dungeons and world be world and structured PVP. You know, you've been doing all these things as you've been leveling. And, you know, I would imagine you would, or they would imagine you wouldn't have been enjoying that. And that's why you've continued playing it. So at level 80, why would they change all that up? They're, and basically all of this was them getting around to them saying that they, the idea of an increasing the group size and doing things like rating, you know, having 10, 15, 20, 25 plus people um, having to come together to do raids just kind of goes against that idea. Um, it's, it's just, I mean, for some people it is a lot of fun, um, but it's not really the idea they're going with here. So th- what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to focus on doing things that you enjoy doing while you leveled up to 80 at level 80. Uh, they mentioned there are eight story dungeons um, that you will encounter throughout the game. Uh, but overall, there are actually over 25 different explorable dungeon paths through those dungeons. Uh, yeah. And I believe they said most were intended for level 80. They didn't give a number or if it was all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the idea being there is tons of stuff for you to do at level 80, even just in the, the dungeon aspect. Yeah, that's that's not even including world versus world and stuff. So I think like the the reason they pretty much st- first of all before I say that I want to say it's like it's pretty marketing savvy for them to say hey there's 25 paths through these eight dungeons to I, I'm not sure how distinct those paths actually are. I think they are pretty distinct, but not like I I wouldn't I think the 25 number they're just throwing around to make people feel like there's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, in the, in it's the end, probably pretty inflated. Yeah, like in, in in the end, I think there's just there's eight dungeons. That's still a lot and they're going to be really difficult for what i've heard from people who've tried the explore mode stuff oh, intended God. for <laughs> <laughs> intended for fun. content. yeah exactly yeah it's it's um so what they meant by the intended for level 80s is um remember like if you go back to a dungeon in guild wars 2 the whole level scaling thing is still in effect so 
when you do a dungeon first, they're, they're going to be drip feeding these out every 10 levels. That's why there's eight of these, because I believe there's the, they including the last dungeon in the game. So when you hit 30, you, there's, a, there's the first dungeon of the game, which is Ascalon Catacombs. And it's going to be another one at 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and a couple more around the world, right? Um, so that's those how they're going to be drip feeding the dungeons, and you'll be able to in- enter them and do the story mode at the level that they introduced the dungeon in. So the second the second dungeon is level 40, so it's accessible to all level 40s. The explorable mode version of all these dungeons are five levels above the, or intended for a minimum of five levels above the um, normal version of those dungeons. So a Ascalon Catacombs, for example, is level 30 normally. You should probably be level 35 before you even attempt the explorable mode of that dungeon because it's going to be really bloody hard. Um, but the reason they say they come back to say those are intended for level 80s is because even though as a level 80, you'll be scaled down to level 30 to do these, or 35 to do those explorable mode dungeons, the fact that you'll have so many more skills unlocked and so many more elites unlocked and just more skill with the game, that's what they've really been intended for. And I think that's pretty cool. Like, like, do you, what, what are your thoughts on this? Like, what, what do you feel about these, like, um, this as one element of the end game? I absolutely love this. I was actually talking to a friend not that long ago and was kind of trying to sell him on the idea of, like, wouldn't it be cool if WoW were to, instead of, Basically, if they were to ditch the 10-man and 25-man raid stuff and just drop everything down to five mans, because just from a balance standpoint, when you have 10 and 25 people in a group trying to do like a raid encounter, um, there's only so much you can really do because you're trying to balance that around all the possibilities that people could be bringing into that raid. Right. You drop that number down to five people, and, and even in Guild Wars, um, Guild War 2's case, where you don't have to worry about balancing around tanks and healers, and you can do so many more really, really cool encounters um with much easier balancing that's that's a really good point the fact that that this five-man content is what it we're going to see for for in-game actually is really exciting for me because i feel like they're going to be able to do some interesting um boss encounters and and really cool things inside the dungeons especially with them kind of hinting out here and there that you know things like puzzles and and platforming might be a part of some of these dungeons as well oh yeah that's going to be interesting because you don't want to platform with 25 people Ever in any context? <laughs> no. God damn, Wolf has, they, Anyway, they, they've done things like that in WoW, and it's not gone over well. <laughs> oh, God, I just don't don't bring me back those memories of that Wolf vs. Wall dungeon. Jesus Christ, <laughs> Mage Knight. What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> I'm gonna preserve my judgment until I play it. I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of raiding, like not a 25 man, but you know, just, just like 10, 16 man kind of raids. But um, I, I'm not sure if the dungeons are gonna be enough to hold my interest for the for as long as i don't know between content updates but you never know hey, it might be enough like i think five men is, is a decent group size yeah at least for you know group content in general and if they're, if they're really difficult as they say they are then uh maybe it'll be challenging enough that you bang your head against it long enough that it, it, it occupies your time between updates well and at, at least it gives us more variety in terms of you know dungeon like yeah. content compared to something like wow or star wars or something where you have one to two raids and that is supposed to last you through an entire content through update. six months yeah 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 definitely i mean i want to come to seeing like uh how long it takes to complete a dungeon on average you know how long between uh new dungeons you know that sort of thing but um so what, what do you guys feel? Because you guys are both WoW vets, I, 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 compared to me, anyway. Um, so what do you guys feel in terms of the fact that A, there's eight of these, uh, which is which I think you both are pretty positive on, but B, that you can do them from all the way from the time when you're only level 35 or 45 or whatever, but also come back to them when you're level 80. What, what are you guys' thoughts on that? I don't... Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, you go first. I, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't think that people are going to like be grinding them through... You know, at, at level 30, I, I think you're going to see most players are going to run the Ascalon Catacombs once. Um, and then maybe at 35, they might come back to it to check out the exploration, um, exploration mode. But that's pretty much going to be the extent of it. So I don't think that, like, there's going to be a worry of, you know, you hit level 80 and you're like, oh, I don't want to do Ascalon Catacombs anymore. I'm so tired of doing it. Like, I think it's going to be still pretty fresh for you because most people probably won't be grinding through these. I don't think people are going to try to level through them. I think if they... If they do, they're insane, because um, there's so many more <laughs> XP. XP is not that good. Well, and there's so many more cool things so. to do in the game. Like, why would you? Why would you choose that as your leveling method? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so how I about get- the fact that um, you, you'll continue to get level appropriate drops? So, doing a level 35 dungeon as level 80 will give you level 80 drops. What, what do you feel about that? 
I, I, that's, that's pretty that's nice. necessary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, so, so when you go back to the, uh, the, the lower level dungeons, you still get level 80 drops. Y- that... You actually get low yeah. level, you actually get level appropriate drops no matter where okay. you go in lower level areas in Guild Wars 2. Oh, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, so it's pretty awesome. It's That's like pretty cool. Chance. Yeah. So that I means you do have a full eight dungeons to explore uh, at level 80, at level eighty. Although you've probably done the lower level ones, and you're probably sick of them by the time you get to eighty. But <laughs> it's, it is nice that you have the option to go back and maybe like play with some friends or whatever. They're lower level. Well, like I, that's, that's like I was saying though, is that I don't think that most players are going to be really sick of them by the time they hit level eighty because most people aren't going to probably run they them probably more won't than maybe play twice. Them too much, yeah. Yeah. Right. And the, re- the reason I've think. kind of ex- excluded Shinboy and Tarkin from this is because we're, we're, Wingy was one vets. And when I heard that um, the dungeon content is going to be level eight, uh, sorry, not level eight, but um, five man teams, I was like, what? No, eight man teams? What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ter- Boy, Shinboy, what are, you, what are your feelings about this? Yeah. What are your thoughts of this? He was joined last. We get, we're going to have to reorder for this dungeon. Everyone leave the party. <laughs> 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 Just, I don't know. It's It's really odd. I, I don't know. Could... Having played through Ascon Catacombs, um, five man is definitely like a, the sweet spot. It's the right number. Really, I mean, it's it's small enough that it's personal, but it's not yeah. like too small where you feel like you're under equipped. Yes. You have a lot of variety of classes you can bring. To yeah, you. I mean, uh, sometimes if you like, because you have fewer people, it's harder to get away with a bad pull, but it's still doable. Right. Yeah. And, well, and, I, I think cool. I think the exclusion of a tank and healer makes a five man that much um, cooler, really, because you know you don't have to be you know when you're trying to get a group together, you don't have to be standing around like, God damn it, we got to try to find somebody who will yeah. take this damn thing. Oh god, there's no there's no there are no healers on right now, yeah. and I just really want to do this dungeon just right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you just like no, like four other people, let's go, let's go do this thing. Like that's really really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And and you're right. Like in the original Guild Wars. The reason that there were eight man teams to some extent was the fact that you kind of you needed a monk, you you needed a healer backline at least in some way. At least when the game first came out, obviously nowadays you see necro healers and like ritualist healers and all that. Necro rich, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, back in the day, you kind of you needed a monk. So there's always like, even though you still had eight people going into it, you had like an element of your team which was always set before even going into the first place, and people you had to look for it to get in. Now, now as Duran said, you can go in with whatever four dudes as long as you're decent at the game yeah yeah and you can get really creative yeah absolutely yeah. And, and and as yeah. somebody who who you know ran a guild and um scheduled raids and and set up raids and ran them i i am totally for only having to get four other people together to do that like Hell yeah. fuck yeah. trying to trying to coordinate 10 people or or more i don't know do part something. of me part of me will miss that, that larger group content though i kind of like the, the larger scale con- uh, battles with you know 10, 12 people. Oh, we'll get there. We, we, we're going to talk about yeah. that in a second. We're going to talk about it in right. a second. It's going to be awesome. Anyway, <laughs> um, I mean, just, just to round it out, Tarkin, what, what are your gut reactions? Did, did you did, you got to try out Ascalon Catacombs. Did you feel that? Um, no, you didn't. You didn't get to no, try No, I out. didn't. Oh, you're level 35. Yeah, you, you was the right level, but he, the first time. I haven't even gotten close to touching Ascalon Catacombs yet, so I, I kind of have to reserve my judgment until I, I play it. Yeah, so Shinboy, you're the one who actually did get it, because Tarkin tried to get in, but at that point there was like um, t- grouping errors and er- issues. What, were you, what are your thoughts as a person who tried Ascalon Catacombs? Did you feel like that's something you want to return to if, like later in the game? Uh, yeah, I thought it was really, really fun. Um, as per the explorable mode, like we only got through the first vote and then just got dominated by the first mini boss. But <laughs> in terms of the story mode, like I wouldn't mind redoing the story mode for someone who hasn't done it yet. I thought it was really fun. Maybe it's just because it was the first time I was doing a dungeon. I don't know, but I thought I would definitely do it again. And that's a good point. Like even though we downplayed the point that, uh, yeah, obviously there's a story mode, but we downplayed the fact that there are multiple routes to these dungeons. So when you're coming back to them for explodable mode as a level eighty or whatever higher level you are, um, not only will you be getting level appropriate drops, but you'll also be able to choose a different route through the dungeon every time you get there and how that works is when you walk in there's like a dialogue thing and you get like the scene with like the people talking like in, in the classic guild was two style with the people on either side of the screen and you you interjecting whether that's a good or or not way of delivering dialogue but either way you get there's a option in the end and you can actually vote on which path you want to take through the dungeon shinboy and Durin, as people who are used to raids is this, is this a is a multiple path kind of thing the way they approach raids how do you feel about that in guild wars 2 uh, did you say is it a way that they do approach raids, or are you saying? Yeah, my phone went off right there. 
Uh, so, okay. so what do you guys think about the whole like multiple pods to the dungeon? Do you think that adds to replayability? Like, how, what do you guys feel? Absolutely, I think it adds to replayability. I mean, you know, again, like the people who who do do raiding and you know raid that same content week after week after week, you get to a point where you're almost like just kind of you're almost like a robot playing your character through a lot of the stuff that you kind of have on farm. Um, and so the the idea of being able to you know this week go down path A, maybe next week we'll do path B. And then maybe we'll go back to path A again. Like it's it's cool to have those options, right? Yeah, I, I, I would assume that would be the case. I think that's kind of an interesting way of doing it. Did they do that in WoW? <laughs> no. <laughs> the be- the best you got was there were there were some instances where you could maybe choose the order that you did bosses in. Like I know uh, with Nexramus, there was you know kind of different wings that you could go down, and you could choose kind of which one you did first or whatever. But it was never like you went down this path and you did these bosses, and the next time you went down this other path and you did these completely different bosses. It was as far as I know, there's never been one like that in WoW. It's always very linear. That's kind of cool. And Mage, what are your reactions to this? Uh, yeah, I think that the path, the branching paths adds at least some replayability. I mean. Or it might just end up being power game. Like, okay, this is the path I'm gonna take for the fastest run, or this is the path I'm gonna take for the best drops. Or, but you know, just playing through the first time, it could be interesting. Just like debate the various merits of different paths and whatnot. Right, and I can definitely see this being an element towards that legendary discussion we had before, of like maybe you have to take this path to get this specific boss as level yeah. eighty to get the drop for your legendary. And it'd be cool to encourage people to try the same dungeon in different ways and not just have that straight, like best path through the dungeon kind of stuff. It's kinda of cool. And then you control the person going for the item by voting for a different path. <laughs> <laughs> do it with your guild. Just 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 do it with your guild. <laughs> Yo, so, guild is not exempt from trolling. <laughs> oh I'm I'm gonna kick people who troll anyway. Um <laughs> I think we nailed that discussion down pretty hard. Do you want to take us to the next one, or do you want me to do it? The ore stuff. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead to the ore stuff. I'm not as familiar with that, so go ahead. Okay, so in talking about it earlier, and um, Mage and I definitely brought up a point. So this is all we've, we've talked so far about dungeons. So that's those are five-man parties um, executing the, these like uh, very instant kind of events where you go through like these long like dungeon dungeon calls. So you've done it before in like RPGs and stuff like that. So something that's new to Guild Wars Two and what we've obviously talked about before is dynamic events. And what um, they've talked about here in terms of end game. Remember this, like this whole discussion was about the end game goes to legendary items, dungeons, so and so forth. But the biggest part of it, and why I've saved it for last, was they actually talked about the final area of Guild Wars Two, which is called Or. It was, it's an island raised by the dragon Zaitan, and he's the guy you'll be finding at the end of the game. And what we thought when we heard that was, having played like the starting areas of Guild Wars Two, that it would be that like, kind of a continuation. Like you kind of keep going through stuff like similar to the starting areas. Uh, there'll be dynamic events as you walk through heart quest, that kind of stuff, and then eventually you get to the final boss. Like the, the area around you would change, but the gameplay itself wouldn't necessarily change. And thank. Thankfully, Arena has come in and said, no, nope, you've been wrong this whole time. We actually have these huge, really awesome sweeping plans for Ore. So the first one I'm going to go through is, so this is the final area of the game. And by this point, you, all the races will be working together in a combined effort to take out this dragon. That's, that's the general idea of it, I believe, right? So there's, in this final island, which is Ore, there's actually going to be three routes to take to actually even start assaulting the island and they've, they've talked about one of them being across land which is you participating with huge sweeping armies um making their way for like huge land bridges and pontoons to get like a, a physical land assault against ore right another one is going to be air base so there's an air and um like a sewer i think i just assume it's like a sewer essentially you have airships you have submarines you have a bunch of different ways to assault like one flank of ore and then another one which is like straight up um what, what, what they what they say? I think that, yeah, I think one was air, and well, yeah, one was like launching golems with people in them into onto like the, the ore and battlefields, um, and yeah, like just straight like a mech. Con- I assume like big like golem combat kind of areas with stuff as another path to get to ore. Like there's like three unique distinct ways to the point where they were saying that this is going to be like storming the beaches of Normandy. This is going to be like people like bashing themselves against really difficult like enemy fortifications even just to start or so what, what let's just start with that what are you guys thoughts i'm going to start with turkey what, what what are your thoughts on this oh god this is gonna be so awesome 
<laughs> Which one would you do? I, I, I'm actually pretty. I'm actually prone to the um, the massive land bridges and stuff. I, I love ro- oh. rolling with the big army. It, it reminds me of the um, Gandara invasion in Nightfall. Kind of, yeah. Uh, to, some, to some extent, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, land. Yeah. Roll with the rest of the army. Exactly. Roll Where with Tom Hanks. Is? Storm the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Shinboy, what, what are your thoughts? I don't know. I'm kind of worried. I'm like less excited, more worried that they don't balance this right because it's not going to get tested in any of the betas. Oh, we'll get that. Well, I, I want to talk, touch on the end, but which which one would you take if you if um, given these three options? Uh I go with the airships. Uh, that's that's a pretty rain, good choice. Rain fire from above. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? Duran, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Amaya Sura is totally getting launched in a war golem. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be badass <laughs> that is that is gonna be freaking cool I, I, I bet you that's gonna be awesome um mage knight what are your thoughts i like the idea of big set piece content pve content but i'm not i'm curious about the replayability like i'm wondering how many times you can go through this this stuff before it gets kind of tiring like i i'm if the if the drops are good but then it's like well the drops aren't really a big deal in gilbert in gilbert's doing game so it's like Play through it once, that's a pretty cool experience, but I'm not really sure what the longevity of this kind of thing is. If they add a lot of these kind of events, or if they, they keep expanding on this one event, that'd be pretty cool. But I, I like how you're like the know. realist of us. I, I'm just <laughs> I'm just being really excited. And then he, he go like, hey, yeah, this is probably good the first time. I just, I just <laughs> got burned by Star Wars it. so bad, oh, man. Yeah. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at, at the flaws of everything oh, now. Oh, believe like, me, I, I know, Mage Knight, the wounds are still healing. <laughs> the wounds are still healing. Star you guys Wars are thinking, thinking about this like an MMO player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is which is. I, I, I know it's. Oh, well, I don't mean to bring you guys down. It does sound really cool. I don't. I can't deny that. <laughs> I'm just wondering. I mean, yeah. This long term longevity. How this will be long term, and I want to add to that with Shinboy's discussion later. So, um, another element of this of or is um, beyond just getting onto or, which is what that was. Or itself is actually going to be unlike other areas of Guild Wars 2. So what they've actually just stated that they're going to be doing is, you know, the whole the whole thing where you have renowned hearts and you travel between renowned hearts and kind of kind of do mm-hmm. events along the way. That's not going to be there. They're going to they're going to strip that out. That, that, that there is no friendly NPC on Or to give you happy quest rewards for doing a renowned heart. Or is going to be badass and be covered in dynamic events only it's going to be a sweeping set of multiple dynamic events interlocking to make a a group-wide effort to assault zaitan's fortresses and get into the final dungeons of the game and this includes a interesting element which they finally kind of took like the wrappers off which is something called a dynamic event web and my response to hearing this was pretty much all caps into the Guild Wars 2 forums and Giant Bomb. Event webs! That is the best idea <laughs> ever! So to, gi- web. <laughs> <laughs> so to give you an idea, um, in Guild Wars 2, there's no quests, right? So dynamic events right. are the things which are essentially gives you goals within the game. And there's obviously dynamic events and renowned hearts, and we won't be talking about those at the moment, but those are essentially quests that are always stagnant in an area and always be there. You go there, your quest rewards after completing it. That, that's not what you're talking about here. Dynamic events are things which change the world around you, are like location based. So if you're traveling through an area, there'll be one that pops up recently. Like there's a farmer who needs help, for example, and I assume there'll be no farmers on ore. So what, what that is, is I, I just can't believe I just said is is. Anyway, so the dynamic events have currently been known as two kinds of types. There's going to be dynamic events in a specific area that's spot up, that they spawn, you do them, they go away. And there's something else called the dynamic event chain, which is essentially there's a there's a dynamic event which when you complete the event, if you get a specific, uh, if you complete the objective, it, tra- it travels onto the next one along event chain. So maybe if you're assaulting a base camp and you um you actually take it over, the next step along the chain is defending that base camp against the enemy who are trying to take it back, Like for example, right? And that's that's a linear thing. So if you progress one way, you get positive responses or like more difficult positive responses. And if you fail like the initial like Genesis event, then it'll go the opposite way. So for example, the enemy will start pushing you back to your other like outposts and so on and so forth. So that's that's a really cool, interesting concept they've introduced into Guild Wars 2 to replace quests. And that was already really exciting. The whole idea of a dynamic event chain was really exciting but what they talked about in terms of 
or is something called an dynamic event web. And what that means is instead of just having a single objective you can complete to progress to a single endpoint, there's actually going to be multiple objectives in any of these dynamic events, right? That result in like other entirely different separated event points, which can also spawn off to their own entirely different event like results and so on and so forth. And I assume it's also going in the opposite direction as well. So like them pushing you back in certain areas in this web will like change events and the events will interact with one another really crazily. This sounds like the most awesome thing and like craziest stuff that could happen, but also as Shinboy says, something that can go all the way wrong <laughs> because if they don't balance it correctly. <laughs> well, um, and, and I think we should probably not get too crazy and, and realize that while this web sounds really, really cool, what's probably going to happen is it is going to web out and you're going to have, you know, this one out there, this one objective that, you know, may, may have two different um, possible outcomes. And then from those, each of those might have two different possible outcomes. But I think that eventually it's all going to kind of come back together again and have, you know, yeah. probably the same general outcome at the end. Yeah, which which is fair. But I, what are your what are your opinions on this, Dirk? What what are your thoughts on like um, how this could go and like what this means for end game content on or? Well, I think that um, it, again, kind of going back to what Shinboy said, if, if we're assuming they can balance this all correctly, um, then I think that that could potentially address Mage Knight's issue of you know replayability of it, where you know you go into here and you may not see the exact same chain of events happening throughout the course of, of this um, dynamic event in or because they might have taken a different direction than it did last time you were here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that could be interesting. <laughs> if, if, like if, the if, there's of, if there's a lot of branches, like it could be, yeah, that could be a lot of replayability there. Cause yeah. You can see how things happen. It yeah. depends just how crazy they make this whole thing. Because I yeah, feel like right. this this area or is their grand experiment. Yeah. yeah, see if I mean, design like, philosophy like, really mentioning, works. This mentioning is, dynamic <laughs> events is like is is sort of nirvana for MMOs, right? Like you just want sort of just stuff just happens and you take part in it. Yeah, and I I think if they can get, make that work, it'd be really cool to see if they can you know blow that out and maybe larger scale, larger scale as as we get more expansion. Yeah, and, and I think yeah. like, like Shinboy saying this is kind of their their um, experiment, and this goes back to Mage Knight's kind of worry. Uh, you know, going back to our experiences with Star Wars, like. Ilum was their experiment, and we see how that turned out. Oh, God, that was terrible. So, so there's, a, there's a bunch of elements to this conversation, and as I am frequently prone to doing, let's just break this down, slow things down, right? So, Tarkin, just before I, 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 I kind of elaborate a little bit more on this, what, what is your general reactions here? I'm unsure. Really? <laughs> how this will play out. Really? You sound pretty sure. <laughs> He's very sure that he is unsure. <laughs> <laughs> so, is, so um, what way? What, what what reservations do you have specifically? Uh, primarily on what content they'll have um, in terms of the dynamic events, right? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I guess I can elaborate on that because, because so you have. Again, this, this, there's, I'm going to be slowing this conversation down. So uh, there, there is a lot to talk about here. So, so, so calm down and strap yourselves in. So effectively, <laughs> you have the dynamic event web, which is something that's going to be um, pretty much spanning across or as a continent. And what they've said before this as part of their entire description statement was that um, dynamic event webs is something they're actually going to be introducing earlier in the game. So they're going to, I love the words they use for this. They're going to wean off players from this, the dynamic event chain and transition them towards dynamic event webs as the game goes on. I, oh, so this isn't just, or this nope. is, this, they're, they're working yeah. this thing. Yeah, this is, yeah. 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 This is why I'm I said this is, this is their experiment <laughs> because if this say fails horribly and doesn't work, they already have the systems in place for the regular chains so that works well. And if they can it does work, out. they can implement it everywhere. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. A reaction from Mage Knight. <laughs> so, yeah, like, I, I, can lo- I love the idea of like maybe level 70, level 40, or 60 content that slowly you'll start seeing less really simplistic in, in the end. Like, I love how I was like so excited about the idea of a dynamic event chain before, but now given this like awesome alternative, I just can't wait to see how it like slowly transitions in because you'll start seeing events exactly like having multiple directions that you can take them that have multiple different like ways of impacting the world around you i i I can't even it's 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 awesome in one hand but it's on the other hand so complex i can't even really come up with an example off top of my head like i wonder what kind of thing would um would 
be encompass all of these issues and changes and thankfully the arena devs gave us an example so what they said was um around or they're going to be temples and for those who aren't who aren't particularly familiar with Guild Wars 2 lore or will used to be a um human settlement it used to be a one of the major human like um civilizations when Tyria was young and what happened there was like shit got real or sunk to the bottom of the ocean if you want to find out more again wooden potatoes is the way to go but essentially um or sunk to the middle of the ocean but those are still like that's essentially still human lands so they still have temples to the human gods so there's going to be a temple of Balthazar, Duena, for example, and obviously the rest as well. I don't think there'll be Cormir at that point. I doubt there'll be a temple of Abaddon, though. Anyway, um, so that they're going to be temples of the human gods. And part of the objective, like the dynamic event web for Or, I assume this is going to be part of it, even the, the smaller... Either way, let's just take... Let's just take that as a statement. A part of the dynamic event web for or is capturing these temples. So they're going to be each like different like hotspots of a dynamic events to take these temples back from Zaitan and the Zaitan control, like the Zaitan's minions to recapture them. And what will happen there is the player base will go into or take, go over, go through all that assaulting process, finally make their way into or, and then eventually have to spread out and take out these temples all around or as a continent, because what the temples do is if Zaitan controls them, there are little uh, statues all around or like as part of like the, the culture itself or was it was a city or was, a, was a group of cities where they were very devoted to the the human gods so they have statues throughout the cities so those statues if the um temple connected to the statue is still controlled by zaitan will have actually huge ne- negative like buff eff- the debuff effects on anyone who goes near them so taking out these temples will affect people on the other side of the map so for example if if you are working on taking on a temple then if you take it, then people who are trying to approach the final dungeon, for example, all the way on the other side of Or, will take, will see benefits from what you're doing here. And this kind of rolls into the rest of the example, but I want to end that little statement there and see what your reactions are. So, Duran, what do you feel about this huge, scaping, like, war front kind of thing they're doing here? I I think I'm I'm kind of with Shinboy. Like, I, I think this could potentially be really, really amazing, but also just from a developer standpoint... This thing could be a fucking nightmare if it goes down. <laughs> yeah, it can. Hell yeah. I mean, I mean again, going back to elaborate. going back to our Star Wars stuff, like we learned that experiments like this, when they when they go bad, uh, they go real I fucking think, bad. I think it's, this this will be just fine. I think this is nothing like what what Star Wars attempted with them. It's it's definitely there's a lot of thought and effort put into this, and I, I think they've already proven that their dynamic events work. So the fact that they're they're sort of merging them together in this big cooperative, like continent wide thing, I think is is awesome and i don't think there's any possible way for it to fail it just sounds too awesome <laughs> there we go. That's the well, you haven't had a one. turnaround <laughs> <laughs> i don't know this sounds really cool well it's it's, it's not so much a, a failure on like the mechanics so much as like just a possibility of a failure on uh balance oh, just people per- 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 balance. Balance. Yeah, yeah, just i really hope this, this is i really hope this encounter is just super hard like i hope it's you're just like fighting blood sweat and tears for every inch of this, this yeah. continent yeah what that's i'm hoping right. for it, i think what's the kind of lovely content i want yeah, I, is just like i think what i'm hoping for out of this is like world be world level of insanity in the battlefield but for a, for pve players exactly yeah absolutely absolutely and this is kind of what we were saying before like when you asked me before about how dungeons is being a five man like you kind of miss that whole 16 to 20 man kind of thing imagine doing this kind of thing as a guild imagine having your guild oh, have yeah. to split out and like take out all these objectives what, what do you like thoughts? like 20 20 30 40 people just like uh yeah assaulting multiple objectives that yeah, that, that's it's exactly. It's Battlefield applied to a MMO or G. This sounds. It's like that could be really cool. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what's know. what. I'm Shit. not as excited. <laughs> really? Well, I'll, I'll get to you, Shinboy. I'm, in I'm a bit, worried. But, um, I, I'm excited to do this once. <laughs> I'm not sure how many times I'll do it after that. But like, this sounds like a one or like a night or two. Oh, yeah, so I'll, just, I'll just, get to Shinboy in a second. But Tarkin, what what are your reactions here? What they've described is awesome, but I think it was Colin Johansson that said that. Dynamic events are six times harder than normal. Yeah, to, to, to do um, it in a quest. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Quest. I'm sure we'll, we'll be one. And one, we have one an event web. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, so, so we're, we're transitioning earlier than expected to pretty much the final element of this podcast, and this, this is kind of where I want to. I wanted to end up, and I'm happy to get here now, even though I was kind of hoping for more. Hell yeah, dynamic event webs. Anyway. Either way, I'm just going to name this podcast Event Web. So fuck you guys. Um, I'm I'm really excited about this. By the way, this sounds 
absolutely fucking amazing to me and I, I can't wait to do it with our entire group. We're going to we're gonna be there as a guild holding down as much of that on Yak's Ben as we can. Anyway, so let's transition to the final element of the podcast. The possible negatives or the, the possible like concerns we have over these events. And I want Shinboy to pretty much list, like, give us an example, give us your perspective. Okay. I'm extremely worried because, you know, you guys have talked about on previous podcasts, I don't know if I was on any of them or not, I don't remember. Anyway, <laughs> about they need to test areas in the beta weekend events for balance. Not so much like skill balance, but so much as difficulty balance for all the events. This area, arguably, actually, I don't even know, arguably, it's pretty cut and dry. Certainly. This area is going to need the most testing of that kind. And there's no way in hell they're going to let anyone test it, like in the open beta format or the beta weekend event format, before release. So I have a feeling that the first wave of people who get there, they're either going to breeze through it and miss the the potential epicness that a really difficult fight could be, or they're just going to hit it like a wall and knock it anywhere, and it's not going to be fun. Yeah, that is definitely a legit concern. Like it's that's what I'm too worried, I'm worried about. Actually, is, is the easy part. I'm worried that it'll just be like sort of breeze through it and everything things going to go just see, fine. I think, I of... think that's the better situation because the ah, way I see it, the way I see it is while people like, I enjoy things that are difficult and it feels really good overcoming something difficult, but you guys haven't mentioned it. This is the last part of your personal story. If these people, like a lot of players that are is playing for their personal story and they can't finish this because it's unbalanced, that sucks. After hearing all the, all these awesome events, it would be very frustrating to not be able to progress through it just because it's just not balanced right. Just, yeah, or yeah, there's not enough players at that finale. point. Yeah. And, I mean, if this is for like a piece of gear or an armor set or something like that and you want to make it super, super hard, go ahead. That's a completely optional. This is for your personal story. So I feel like they have to get the balance perfect, which is going to be difficult to do, especially at launch. Yeah, so so Cynic and I recently hopped into Guild Wars 1, um, and <laughs> I had never played it before. Cynic obviously had. Uh, and, and one of the first things you do kind of at uh, the end of the tutorial stuff is you do kind of a, a four-on-four battle with potentially other players. Um, however, when the game has been out for this many years and the sequel is on the horizon, um, not many players tend to be making new characters in Guild Wars 1. So... We ran into an issue where, on our side, it was me, uh, Cynic and myself, and two NPCs. Um, and then, right before we were we were to enter, um, another player joined the opposite team, and so it was essentially two players and two NPCs versus one player and three NPCs. And so I kind of felt bad for the guy because you have to progress through this in order to finish. You, you there is no. Well, you failed, but it doesn't matter. It was just kind of something to do, and now you move on out of the tutorial. It's like, no, you failed, so now you got to go back through and do it again. Um, and it's kind of, you know, same idea can pertain to this. Like, like Shinboy is saying, you know, if you if it's too hard, but it is required to finish the story, like that's that's just not fun. Yeah, pretty much. Actually, in your example, even if you fail, you can. You progress. Really? I don't, either way, yes. like the it's point like here that he's raising. <laughs> I, 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 I just remember. Uh, well, yeah, sir. I, I write. Um, I think the point <laughs> to be made here is beyond the. First, okay, well, I, I want. I want to talk about both of these separately. So, but I'll list them out now. But first of all, um, early game when the first people do this, it's going to be interesting. I, I know we'll talk about that in a second. And second of all, how this is going to be months off the release, right? So. But we'll get there. But first of all, Turkey, what, what do you feel about the um, the fact that they they haven't even they pretty much cannot possibly give this the playtesting it kind of really needs before release? Like, how do you feel it'll end up, Turkey? I'm thinking it's going to be a lot more difficult initially than intended because uh, the first people to reach here are usually. The ones that pretty much rush everything. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, so like you're very much correct in that saying. The first people who who hit these dynamic events, as Mage Knight and Shinboy have rightly pointed out, are going to be hitting a very interesting situation because they'll probably be in like an inverse of what it'll be like for many years after release because they're going to hit there and no one's going to be with them so if there's going to be these large sweeping dynamic event chains and there's only maybe like 50 or 100 level 80s on the server then 
it's going to be hard for them because they they can't exactly like get together and plan it out. They're, they're going to hit this area, be the only only level eighty they can see, and then kind of be fucked because they they can't progress without really hitting all these crazy separate objectives. Like Shane Boy, what, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like that's interesting because at that point you're pretty much saying that you can't finish your personal story unless the rest of the server catches up level wise. Exactly, it's like the inverse Which is pretty problem. Pretty lame. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and so what you'll get there is those people will be like kind of held almost invariably like looking at this how it is here almost invariably those people will be held up but then you'll have a situation where most of the server will catch up to them hit level 80 and you have this like probably period of about a month or two where that area is going to be the most exciting area of the whole game like you're going to have a bunch of people hitting it enough people so that and the, a, 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 there could be two problems. Either enough people hit it that it's going to be freaking awesome for that period of time that it'll die down, or B, they don't get the level scaling down, or sorry, the, the player scaling down right. So you have so many people crashing against those areas that the player scaling gets crazy, all the bosses take forever to kill, and no one makes any progress for weeks and weeks and weeks. Like th- Those yeah. are kind of the two things that could happen. Mage Knight? I mean, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, <laughs> you, you finish and then like, there's going to be a, a, a golden period where it's going to be the the best area to be, and then after that, it's just going to, you know, it's going to be interesting to see when like um, a lot of the main people who are playing consistently are already max level and they're not going to be doing this content at least not as often. When you get the people who say buy the game, say like eight months after release, when they finally get up to level eighty, is there still going to be enough people doing this content? I hope so. Interesting. Well, say say two years after release. Yeah, people rolling alts. You got people, always new people coming into the game. I'm sure it'll be populated enough. It won't be like golden era populated, but well, let's talk about that in a second because there's obviously ways that can can combat that. But Duran, what what do you feel like it's going to be for the first couple people who get to this area? What what do you think that's going to how it's going to play out? Um, Well, for the first couple people, I think everyone's pretty much on 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 point on that one. I think it's just going to be. Unless they just, unless they just happen to have the right amount of people that happen to kind of rush through everything and get to that max level, it is probably going to be either very frustrating for them or incredibly easy. Um, but how how, how think, big how in terms of like negative press and stuff? Do you think there'll be a huge impact on the game if people do get to end game and feel like they just can't get over it? I think so because mm. end game is everything in an MMO. And if the you know final thing that you're doing on your your character in terms of personal story stuff, if that's just not obtainable, you know that's going to be really bad press for ArenaNet on the launch of their um, this this massive what is what they're hoping to be you know genre changing MMO. And if this should, is kind of one of their big features for their MMO, and if it doesn't work with that first group of people, like that's that's going to make gaming headlines. I think <laughs> it's it's going to be interesting because like. As, as you said correctly, MMO, I'm sorry, Endgame is the core of what MMO is at the moment. So it, it's when you look at Arena's strategy for Guild Wars 2, one, one of the things they've stated over and over again is that their idea is that it should be fun all the way through the game. And, and we've, all, we've all felt, I'm pretty sure we've all felt what they mean by that. It's, it's been pretty awesome. Pretty much at the get there, you're already fighting huge bosses at level 10, right? But the thing is, the people who are going to get there first, get to the end game first, are the same people who will be rushing to the game because they're used to games like World of Warcraft. They're going to be forgetting all the stuff they see along the way and get to end game and pretty much expect like what they see in those games, which is like a final dungeon, then like a bunch of raiding content and all that kind of stuff. Those are the same people who will be complaining loudest anyway. Right. So, what do you guys feel the dynamic of that? Do, do you think that the, those people are people arena should be concerned about? Do, do you think those people are something they should be um, perhaps balancing it for the first couple people to be really easily done with it with very few people? Like Shinboy, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's. I was gonna say they're better off if they're not sure how it's balanced going in. I would say they should go with the easier side of it. That way, those people can get through it, even if it's really easy. They can always. It's easier for them press wise. To make it easy and have people get through it and then ramp it up as opposed to have no one being able to complete it and then try and bring it back down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It kind of sucks to see like one guy made it through easy because he, he got through it, got there a week earlier and they, they, they buffed it right before you got there and then suddenly it's a struggle way harder than you <laughs> but that, did. That's something that happens that's, in a lot of games balance wise. Yeah, There's really true. nothing you can do about it. Yeah. You're going to have a shitty situation either way. So I want to transition this to what it'll be like after a couple of months. But 
how do you guys feel about the possibility that they made these events scale really well in that if five people are do- doing it, it's particularly challenging but if more people are doing it, it stays challenging Dur- during uh, we've already seen this kind of like uh difficulty scaling in bosses for example frozen fell creek in the uh, level 10 um norn area is it perfectly achievable i did it with robbie mack one of our other guild leaders with about 10 people but when i did it earlier um in my first beta weekend event i did it with about 40 people and it was also really legitimately interesting and difficult like do you think they can nail it with this one during um i think I think they could, but again, because of the idea of these these event webs and kind of just this, so many directions this this stuff can go, it's going to be very hard to make sure that all of it is balanced very well. I think that's why we're going to possibly run into. I don't even think possibly. I think we're going to run into an issue of imbalance in some way, whether it's you know too easy or too hard. I don't think I don't think it's a question of if. I think it's just which direction is it going to go? Uh, just because there is there are so many. Uh, variables in this event web idea um, that even just balancing that alone is going to be difficult. And then to balance that around the number of people. Um, yeah, I think, I think that is definitely going to be an issue. So uh, this, is, this is something I kind of want to open up to everyone. So, but um, what do you guys feel? Uh, see, in my perspective, I think that it's very unlikely that arena net hasn't already thought of these problems. I actually, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I actually think that it's, um, it's because they do have a closed beta and it's running right now. It's running actually 24 seven. They announced that um, in the background. I, I believe that these end game areas, because they know of those people who are used to other MMOs rushing to the end game, they're gonna make these pretty polished. I actually think that these will be about second to the starting areas in terms of polish. I actually believe in Million and think they're gonna make this. Perfectly approachable by both a small amount of people and a large amount of people. So, what what do you guys think? Did, Shibai, what's your response to saying that? Hey, maybe Arena's already thought of that. Well, I mean, they already thought of that for the starter areas, and obviously those are the most polished. Yeah. And then you run into something like the Flame Shaman. <laughs> just <completely. laughs> so, just because they thought about it doesn't mean it's going to be well done. That's a good. That's a very good point. The, the Flame Shaman point. So, I, I very much agree, and I think I want to transition from that into what it'll be like a couple of weeks or perhaps months after release because it's very well to say and i actually still think that they probably have it down i, I bet they know about this it's but it's very well to say that um at, at, in during that golden period as mage knight definitely um, nailed it with that statement during that golden period um it's going to be amazing for the Bronto players everyone as as a group is generally going to kind of reach level 80 because they the arena has already stated that the one and a half hours or so for a level up is about what they're looking for so you, you're going to see a bunch of people hitting level 80 hitting those those areas at the same time and having an amazing experience for the first couple of months right so what do you guys feel it'll be like immediately after that as less and less people are going to be doing the end game level 80 content um, and you'll see that like that drop off in people in that area. Like Shinboy, this this is one of your major concerns. So run me through it. Yeah, like I feel that they'll get the balance right during that golden age, and it'll be like, okay, this is fun for everyone. There's a good amount of players here. And then I don't know. It's gonna gradually drop off, and if they don't continually balance this area, if they keep the difficulty where it was during the quote unquote golden age, it could be really difficult for those players right after that. Yeah, because because the major point is that this is this is gonna be part of your personal stories. I mean, we've been brought this up over and over yeah. again. This this is not going to be um, particularly... It's, it's not something you can do with it in exclusion. Like, you can't only do the dungeon. Well, you can, and I'll get to that in a second, without having done all, all this other stuff to make that specifically more easier. Because, as I said earlier, you have those statues throughout the content of or that's like it seems like one of the major key factors in term, in in linking all of or together in terms of the secondary objectives making doing all this other stuff is going to make the approach to the final dungeon easier so what they've said is the final dungeon is actually going to be at the end of this like huge kind of in inverted commas path like it's, it's obviously not just going to be a, a land bridge with the dungeon at the end of it but along this path is going to be um these those specific uh statues and if you if you capture all these secondary objectives, you're going to make it much easier because the chapters would be deactivated, or maybe they'll even active and be giving you buffs instead of debuffs because you've captured those areas. So what it'll mean is on the route up to the final dungeon, you'll make it much easier or more difficult by your level of progress in the rest of ore. Um, now they have that, that that does mean that you do not have to do any of that secondary content to get to the final dungeon. You can do it. It'll be harder, but you can do it. Um, but at the same time, like how hard 
could they make? Like, w- would it be almost impossible? Would would it be too much to ask for those people coming back to the area months after the golden age to be able to do that by themselves without having a huge like coordinated effort? Like Major Knight, what what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think the legendary system might help with that because uh, if people like you know if there's legendaries attached to that area, they could even add you know, legendaries later that attach to that area. And uh, you know, make come, make people come back to get those legendaries. That's a good know, point. I actually didn't think doing certain that. yeah, <laughs> doing, doing, doing certain doing certain uh, quests and, or objectives to get legendary ingredients and stuff. That could be an, a good draw to bring people back. Especially to Especially since old it's, it's a dungeon at the end. There, there's going to be a, a set of armor that you get from doing the explorable mode. So that could bring people back. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 really cool, Dorian. What are your thoughts here? Um, I think I think I don't think the issue is going to be a couple months after release. What I worry about is a year or two years out, um, the new players coming back. Like like the legendary thing could be a, a draw to some extent, but I'm just thinking about the new player. You know, a year and a half down the road, just you know, getting to Or for the first time. Like, what's their experience going to be like? Yeah, they're, they're kind of be missing out on all this fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. That's pretty much all he can say. Like that's, that's what they're going to be doing, and obviously, like the, the end note to kind of this is Arena obviously will change this. Like they, they, it will not be a case where they'll balance it once and then leave it for players and only be fun during that golden age and then be drop up, drop off after that. They're obviously going to like patch the game, change the the levels, not the level scaling, but the difficulty scaling of those areas, make it easier for a consolidated small group of people to take on all of ore by themselves. Like, well, well I mean, do you think that's a case? We, like, do, do, <laughs> we, 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 could, we, could, we could hope that they would do that, but uh, you know, again, kind of going back to to Star Wars, players hoped that uh, Bioware was going to fix their issues with uh, Ilum, and instead, what they did is they decent, uh, de-incentivized the zone because they just they couldn't figure out how to balance it, and so instead, they basically just made there to be no reason to go there anymore. Ilum, for context, is there is there open like sort of an open battlefield area? Yeah, it was kind of their their answer to WoW's Winter Grasp. It was a kind of an open, like you said, an open battlefield area between factions, and there were kind of uh, dailies that you could do there, and, and and kind of objectives that you would do aside from just killing each other. Um, but they ran into some balance issues with that, as well as obviously some technical issues too. Um, but it, it was also hastily thrown in. It, it was, it not was yeah, very well developed. But but like. The issue with it was like they they had some problems balancing it, and instead of actually balancing it and figuring out a way to make it fun, they they basically they all removed it. it. Yeah, it might as well be gone from the game now. Yeah, no one goes there. There's just no point. And so, like, so was this part of your I, 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 personal I story? That, like, was this something you had to? No, do? it's not. No, no, no. It's, no, it's, it was something. It's a post a post person. But I'm story using it thing. as an example because basically, like, you say that you know Arena will will go through and they will balance it and they will fix this like. Like you would hope, and, and a lot of people hoped <laughs> that they would have done the same with with uh, the Bioware would, would have done the same with Ilum, but it turns out they didn't. And so I, I don't right. think we can say you know for w- with authority like oh it'll get fixed because I mean s- people can say what they will about Bioware they still generally are a mostly respected company, <laughs> um, <laughs> and and pe- people had a lot of faith in them with How with that game and that in. stuff. And, and, and that stuff was going to get fixed and things were going to, you know, be good. But when they make a, a decision like that, like it makes you kind of worry. And, you know, Mage Knight's kind of hesitation kind of throughout the subjects we've been talking about in this podcast come from kind of that same idea. And so it, you can't help but be a little wary with something like this, like the balancing of it as the game goes on. Like, are they going to be able to continue to balance this? And are they willing to continue to rebalance this over and over again based on, you know, possible player populations a year two years three years down the road shimbo what was your response to this what do you feel like they're pretty much yeah, on the money cause, yeah because like say i'll use this as a good example right now it is steam sales and <laughs> i have uh, a friend of mine who's like trying to get into pc gaming but he doesn't have the rig for it so he's looking to build one down the road and say because the first guild wars is on steam say guild wars 2 eventually goes on steam and he picks it up to two and a half years from now on sale are there going to be enough people to, to get through this content when he starts playing. So do you do you do you have faith in the arena that like a, like making changes, patching that stuff out, making it easier for people along the line? Um, yeah, I don't see why they wouldn't. I mean, I'll use UW as a good example. Um, it's underworld for people to... who <laughs> don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, okay, underworld. Yeah, it's one. It's one of the elite areas in, in Guild Wars One. Um, they've managed to add and subtract things from underworld and change builds and everything um, to keep it balanced. 
like they added um, that extra boss at the end, Doom, and that made it more difficult, um, but it was still doable. You just needed the right team. So I I have faith in them to keep things balanced. Yeah, so as as you you pretty much keep on the money, because your Durin's and Mage Knight's concerns are very, very well-founded in other MMOs. For example, yeah, the one we keep... The whipping boy, apparently, of this podcast is Swotor. Um, (laughs) We keep going back to... Let's talk about Aeon. That game's great. (laughs) (laughs) So what we keep going back to is, like, um, it all comes down to what ArenaNet does. And we're not going to talk about this podcast, but... Arena has promised pretty wholeheartedly that they're going to be supporting Guild Wars 2 with a lot of um, post-release support. And at least as a Guild Wars 1 player, I can say that pretty much every every point along the way, I feel they pretty much nailed it in Guild Wars 1, at least to some extent. It, they, maybe the time scale wasn't perfect every time, but eventually all the major gripes were addressed in some way or another and somewhat fixed in pretty much across the board. So I actually don't feel that as a Guild Wars 1 player, I, I believe I believe in Anet here. I'm going to say that right now. I believe in Anet. I, I think <laughs> they can pretty much... Um, they know that these are issues, and we, we're pretty much just stating it out there for the audience who's listening to who may think we're being a bit negative. We're pretty much putting this out there because we want to state it right now where our stances are on these issues. We, be, I believe, at least personally, that Anet knows, and they, they're going to look at this content pretty much not even only months down the track, but they're going to be continually looking at this content and saying, hey, what's not working out? Are these temples too hard to capture? Um, what kind of time frame will it take before the... Uh, push back by the enemy will, will be on these temples like would you have to pretty much have people there at all times to keep them or would you be able to take them and maybe they'll be yours for another four hours like stuff like that is stuff that you can um, adjust and continue to look at as the game goes on and as it was one player I, I think they'll, they've will they proven that they probably could do that and it'll be quite an interesting event but in general just to um to round this discussion out if you had to look at all this endgame stuff, legendary weapons, these dungeons that you can return to with multiple paths to them, 25 paths in the game, and this really cool end game, last last area of the game, which is kind of like an open world, almost raid kind of thing. Um, what's everyone's reaction? To how do you feel about the endgame in Guild Wars 2? Durin? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and be Fox Mulder here and say, I want to believe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, I, I, I really, like, I'm, I've... I've loved every aspect of the game that I've had a chance to play, maybe with the exception of structured PvP, but I'm, I'm willing to give that one another chance. Um, so I, I I want to believe that ArenaNet will will do right by the players and continue to support not only with you know new content through expansion packs or, or content updates or whatever, but continue to you know remember the, the new players as the game continues on and continue to kind of balance things out um, as they go along, as opposed to what most other MMO uh, developers do, and that is to basically kind of ignore the new player experience once everyone has kind of settled out at max level. And so how, looking at all these options, do you feel that they've uh, announced enough endgame contact to, to keep you happy? Um, I feel like they have announced enough endgame content to keep uh, most players happy for at least a couple of months. Uh, I'm really interested right. to see... Uh, you know, kind of like you said, like two, three months down the road, I'm interested to see what they're going to introduce there. I feel like they, they need to introduce some new stuff. This stuff is, is I mean, it's nice and it's going to last us a little bit, but they have to know that players, that, that there are going to be players that are just going to devour this content as fast as they can and will, you know, within months be demanding new content. And hopefully, if I mean, if they, I, I know they're not subscription based, but if they want to keep their numbers up, um, they, they definitely still need to cater to those players as, as well as people like us who are willing to take our time and enjoy the game. Interesting. Mage Knight, what, what was your reaction to all of these endgame offerings from Gear Wars 2? Skeptical. I mean, like, wow. like Doran, I, I want to believe, but I'm not entirely convinced. I mean, obviously I haven't played any of it. I can't say until, like, for sure until I've, I've played some of it, but I don't know. I'm not sure. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah. I just, I, so like, legendary sure weapons, they, they don't do anything for wait, you? What a, legendary weapons don't really do anything for me like it really comes down to how much i like the pvp which i'm sure i'll, I'll probably get into it but that's sort of the main draw i think for for good was doing game right now like yeah. all this pve stuff sounds interesting but it sounds interesting for like one or two tries for i don't know or maybe more than that for the dungeons but well, that's, I, I don't really <laughs> that's know. why when you asked cynic if it was enough for me I, I i responded with i think for the general player it you know might last a couple months for the general player for me it probably be world, okay. world is probably going to be enough yeah, for I, a game I was, for me personally I'll, I'll get to my reactions to this in a bit world versus world will come up um Shin Boy, <laughs> what, what is your opinion on this do you think these um, offerings are huge or did, did enough to make you happy yeah well 
like, um, I think between the legendary weapons, which are pretty much just as good as any other weapon, but with a rarer skin, and, like, um, going through dungeons to get certain armor and all that, I think, and I mean this in a good way, it's par for the Guild Wars course. Yeah. Which is great for me, because <laughs> I played 2,600 hours of the first game, so... <laughs> Tell you so I, I think it, it's pre- it's pretty consistent with what Arena Net's been doing, um, and I think that's great. Awesome, Tarkin. I'm with Shinboy. Um, my stance is that Arena Net really does take um, post-launch support seriously um, yeah. to a greater extent than most other games. <laughs> and like, for example, in Guild Wars One, they introduced Sora's Furnace as a free add-on. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. And stuff like that. So will you be pursuing Maybe. legendary weapons? Maybe. I'm Ooh. I'm not sure. Like depends how if, hard that's if, if it's as difficult as they're <laughs> implying, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and around it out, I'll give my impressions. And um as Mage and I hinted at, for me, um I I I I just can't because Guild Wars 2 is a game of many facets. It's a game with structured PvP, World vs. World, and PvE. And the fact that they've announced all this stuff for PvE, as a person who pretty much went through PvE once in the original Guild Wars and kind of touched it every now and then where they give us free content, but generally only once, I, I'm, as a person who looks at Guild Wars holistically, I am floored with all this offering. I cannot, I love the fact that they're giving us all of this, um, mainly because I, I, all my end game even beyond this stuff, is going to be in World vs. World. I know I'm going to spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours in that. And if I can do that as well as find a sweet legendary rifle to make my World vs. World dude all that much more feared, I am totally there. I cannot wait. This is going to be amazing. And at least for that golden period, that, that period in Ore where the huge Brit like assaults, like combined assaults, I know that our guild looking for us is going to be rocking it up for quite a while there. And we're going to be abusing some of our world versus world chops in that case. We're going to bring some <laughs> of our awesome experience there to, to bear and maybe carry Yakta Bend again like we had to do during the night. Um, if you don't know what You that- guys got to pick it up. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Yeah. yeah. No, but we, this is going to be... It's going to be awesome. And, and again, structured PvP is there for people who like it. I'm still kind of offensive about that, but World vs. World is where my end game is. You don't like it because you're bad at it. And the fact that they're doing all this <laughs> PvE stuff is making me even more happy. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to get... I'm, I'm probably going to try for the Knight Greatsword. I, I kind of think that'll look pretty cool. And I'm definitely going to look for the rifle, whatever they do there. So with that, is there anything we've missed? I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure we hit these topics pretty much on the head. Before we close out, I, I wanted so many to... Topics. to make one uh, observation here. And then I also wanted to kind of pose a question to everybody. Um, the first thing I noticed is those of you that have played an arena net game before, you know, basically guild wars one, um, were much more confident in yeah. what the end game brings. Whereas those of us who maybe have been hurt before <laughs> are bringing in a bit of res- reservation. And that's, it's, it's really interesting because I mean, we, you know, we can see, you guys clearly know what arena net is, is capable of and what they've done in the past and, and can be more confident in that. And that's good to hear as somebody kind of coming in as an outsider um, who yeah. has dealt with, you know, companies like blizzard and, and bioware and, you know, other companies, uh, turbine cryptic. <laughs> <which are the MMOs. laughs> <He> just keeps <laughs> going. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, seeing how they handle things like end game and, you know, to, to see what, what arena net is, is, saying they're offering and and we can't help but go into that being like you know this is what they're saying they're offering but what are they really offering so it's it's, yeah. it's comforting like i said to somebody as an outsider to, to hear you guys be so confident in what arena net is is capable of and what and to say like no they're 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 gonna kill it that you know they're capable of that like that's that's really cool i'm happy to hear that because that's that's kind of one of, I, I love this podcast and, and this group of people because we do have such a huge range of p- different backgrounds I, I i definitely feel that for those out there worried about this kind of stuff that you should look to people like me and shinboy and Tarkin who played thousands of hours of the original guild wars and see what our reactions are and and and, and know that we do a bunch of us do share your fears like this is going to be a very interesting thing progressing into guild wars 2 and see how it all plays out because definitely for people who've played a lot of mmos definitely during a mage night uh, you, you can see where they're coming from and you can see where me and shinboy come from and hopefully it tends towards 
our way of the middle, like our side <laughs> of the middle. It's going to be interesting to see going forward. So Anyone? Go the, the, the question I wanted to bring up, um, kind of past that, is uh, I wanted to bring this up now because we're ta- we've been talking about dynamic events and and um, probably more importantly the uh, the uh, renowned hearts. Um, and I'm afraid we're not going to get on, into that subject on another podcast, at least for a little while. And I, I, I wanted to kind of bring this up to everyone because we were talking about, you know, players experience a ways out from release of the game. And um, did anybody here play Warhammer Online? Nope. No. Okay, well, <laughs> it had a, uh, a system in it kind of similar to what the Renowned Hearts are, um, where it was basically uh, the idea of like group questing. So you would have an area, you would walk into it. And you would kind of immediately become a part of the the um, the quest, and you would work with the other players to finish the uh, the quest. Basically, go to the quest giver and and you know receive your reward. And one thing that I noticed with that, because I came into it quite a while after it, it was it released, and I, I even came back to it even later on, was going back, um, especially quite a ways out from release, and trying to do some of those. While they might have been doable they weren't fun because there was nobody else doing there doing them with right. me. And like, do you, do you guys worry um, that that might be an experience that a Guild Wars two player a year or two years down the road might have even like excluding or entirely just talking about the, them, you know, playing from the starter zone on, like, is that going to be a fun experience? And are there going to be players there to play with two years down the road? I think those. It really depends on how popular the game is. Yeah. Right. Like it. It yeah. really depends on on how people pick it up and if people new people are constantly coming in. I mean, if it, if it's just a, a core group of people who are playing it, then it probably won't be much fun to do that group content alone. It's interesting because it's, it also depends on reading a strategy. Like, at the moment, I think you can pick up pretty much all of the original Guild Wars for twenty bucks or so. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. it, it depends what they because Guild Wars two. As as we all have noticed, is a buy to play game. It's it's, it's you mm-hmm. pay a certain amount. There's no subscription fee, and they'll be supporting themselves through like the gem store and like sell, like sorry um things like post release DLC things like that. Ho- hopefully, anyway, we've discussed it last week. Um, ha- it's a real huge question of how much will Guild Wars two cost once the first expansion comes out. That's that's a huge question. How much um, will they make it free? Like, will they make it free to play? Like, is this is the gem still going to be so successful that do you guys think that Guild Wars two will be free to play? And I think there's something we can definitely hit on uh, post release of the game when, when we're getting towards like that kind of things and seeing how everything's going. But what I can say is when your first question was. Uh, would you th- feel that there's a bunch of other people and also would you think it would be fun? I think those are actually two different questions because I can say that um, through most of my time in the Beta Weekend events, for the first for the first Beta Weekend event, I actually spent pretty much all of that time alone. And now, definitely in some areas of the Northern and Starter area, I was surrounded by hundreds of other people. Um, like, like, for example, Frozen Fell Creek, I did with 40 other people on the first day. But a lot of the time I was alone and I can say that Guild Wars 2 is still fun completely alone like even doing group like stuff that is generally done with group content obviously they've already said that if there's not enough people in a zone that a bunch of those um dynamic events would spawn and what that ended up mean meaning was the fact that i actually went through the zone only be able to do content that i could do by myself anyway like the, the the bigger content didn't spawn like obviously that could end up with events like i couldn't do the shatterer alone because that wouldn't even spawn if i was the only one there like that, that's a huge problem but it was still really fun by myself playing Guild Wars two for those like twenty hours I did with my necromancer, like, I I could I think that's one side of the question. The other side of the question though, whether there'll be people and enough people there to do those larger dynamic events a couple of years after release, I, it depends on arena net. Shinboy, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't know. I I don't really see any way that any of us can predict what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Only time can tell. Yeah. Really. Well, I think one thing that the game might have going for it is the lack of subscription fees. So. You know, um, yeah, people can always come back. Yeah, to exactly. Like you can, you can, you know, you decide you want to take a break six months in or something. Take, yeah, it'll take a, you know, six, eight month that break is, and then come back and start a whole new character, start fresh. One of the greatest strengths of the Guild Wars series is the ability to kind of slip in and out of it as you gain and lose interest, which I think is is going to keep their their population pretty stable. Yeah, yeah. And and again, like as I said, what if it, what if Guild Wars Two goes free to play? And that's something we'll talk about in a different linking cast. So with that, um, <laughs> I think we'll end up the show. We're about two hours, two and a half hours. So I want to end it there. Um, I, I, I'm going to say that I, I, this is pretty pretty cool. I, I'm, it's interesting to see the range of responses here. I'm going to bring it up again. I'm pretty happy with who we have on today. Anyway, um, I, anyone have any plugs? Darren, do you have any plugs? 
Um, well, we uh, kind of pre-recording talked about we are going to do a live show for yes. next Friday, uh, going mm-hmm. for the the beta weekend event. Um, what you can kind of expect out of that is we plan to hopefully get a couple of people to uh, roll along with us. We're going to start in Asura and check out the Asura starting zone. Um, yes. as, as before, we are going to take any questions somebody might have. So if you're uh, watching and you want to ask us a question, be sure you set up a Twitch account so that you can log in and ask us that question via chat. Um, and you know, if you have a question about how traits are handled, how the character sheet looks, how inventory, like we'll definitely, you know, absolutely go into that stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the Twitch channel for that is, is my Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash Durin, D O U R I N. Uh, we'll yeah. be starting that. Uh, what did we decide, Cynic, on the start time on that? Uh, normal t- starting time. So 9 p.m. Eastern time, U.S. Uh, so it will be there. And it'll probably be go for about an hour to two hours, um, which yeah. is, like runs through the serious starting area. Last time we did World vs. World, we feel like that, that was good coverage of World vs. World. It's hard to do World vs. World as a live stream. So we're doing the serious starting area. But definitely, if you guys want to suggest things for how we spec out a character or see different classes and stuff we'll definitely be there to to show you guys that stuff or um answer questions and so on and so forth that, yeah, yeah absolutely um, absolutely um Nate, do you have anything to plug uh giant bomb pc gaming hub find us in the uh, pc gaming forums on giant bomb we have a mumble server come hang out with us we're pretty cool yeah yeah <laughs> nice it's great do you want do you want to do you want to plug your star wars guild at all uh castle run on Corellian run uh <laughs> You can find us if you want to, I guess. I'm doing that to be mean. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shame boy, do you mean the no plug? Idea. Uh yeah, I'll just plug my site again, pluginplaygaming.com. Um I haven't really had a lot of time to write anything because uh, I've been taking summer classes as well as working. Um but yeah, uh should be some cool stuff coming up. Like I just bought into the shoot mania beta, so I'll have access to that until the game comes out. So I might be do- doing some video with that. I'm really bad at it. <laughs> Target I- I anything? It's kind of a bad game. I know, right? Targeting? Uh, it's it's like too twitchy. Anyway, we'll get there. <laughs> nothing, nothing. Is he there? Tar- Tar- this, this is my my on, ongoing question for <laughs> Targeting. He kind of pauses before he talks. Targeting, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Anything <Okay>. to plug? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No, no. <laughs> and I am Slocum Cynic. This has been the Lincoln Cast. I'm not sure. This is episode twelve, I think it is. Um, yes. thanks for everyone who's joined us over the last couple of weeks. We've had a huge influx of people joining in and starting to listen to our podcast out of nowhere. It was originally intended for just our guild, but if you're enjoying it, I'm happy to have you. Um, the during last last week for questions for the show, the main question I kept getting was, um, "Can I join your guild?" The answer is absolutely yes. Um, you can find us on the Guild Wars 2 forums on Giant Bomb, which means you can just search Giant Bomb Guild Wars 2 and find us there. Um, yeah, everyone's welcome. We, we, I, I've heard, like, as time goes on, I'm hearing more and more about Guild screening and, like, having, like, interviews, sky, like, yeah. voice vent interviews for people. Like, no, like... Yeah, I've done that. That stuff's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> for us, like, the, the entire mentality is um, I want as many people in the Guild as possible so people can find the other ones who find the same interests. So there's definitely a bunch of us who like structured PvP. There's a whole lot of us like World vs. World. All of us like PvE so far. So you can definitely find what you're wanting by joining the Linking Force, which is now, the okay, we'll now that that said, um, if you are a if you're a jerk, kick, kicked, yeah, yeah. If you don't don't even bother because you will be kicked. So <laughs> yeah, if you're um, worried if about us be- saying, if you're worried about us saying, oh, we we don't want as many people to join as possible. Like, don't worry, we're not one of those guilds. <laughs> yeah, we're not we're not one of the oh, um, God. L- l- sitting in Lions Arch saying, "Hey, new guild, want to join?" You're not one of those guys. So um, okay, for Guild Wars One vets, we're not lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that out. There. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're definitely making sure that the community stays good, but everyone's welcome to at least join. Um, and definitely no come, you know, come to the Giant Bomb forums and and check out the Guild Wars sub forum. There's tons of conversation oh, God, going on there. Water. A lot yeah. of good discussion yeah. going on. So, we're, we're really we actually a lot of times a day we're more active than Guild Wars Two Guru. It's kind of crazy. Um, but mm. e- anyway, with that, uh, you can contact us for this podcast on the at gmail dot com. Also at the Linkincast on Twitter. If you want to contact me there or follow me there, uh, I pretty much just use that to announce um, when the show goes out. But if you have any questions for me, I'll answer, answer them on the spot. Just at me on there. Um, aside from that, uh, thanks for listening. And this has been the Linkincast. Uh, cheers. Stay around after the break. To if you want to see maybe if we get around to a couple minutes of what we've been playing.
So, Shinboy, um, you wanted to talk about what you've been playing. <laughs> I've been playing all of the video games. <laughs> like, I've been playing so many games, it's crazy. <laughs> wait, 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 so, let's right, we'll see. Let's through them. Don't, okay, let's see. We got Darksiders, we got Super Meat Boy, we got Blacklight Retribution, Holy we got God. Shoot Mania, we got Saints Row the Third. I just picked that up the other day. That game is batshit crazy. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I've actually, I actually convinced at least two friends to buy that game when it went on sale. Like I, I played like um, my roommate last year had it for the 360. So I, I, I saw him play a little bit of it, and I played like I don't know, maybe an hour of it myself. But I just started it yesterday on the PC, and when you like just fly through the plane, I was literally sitting there. <laughs> I was playing with the controller. I put the controller down. And I was just like, what is going on in this game? <laughs> and the, the crazy part is, it just gets crazier. <laughs> oh, I hope so. Oh, that's cool. Oh, man. I, I can't decide whether I want to play with a controller or keyboard and mouse, though. Mm. I, I play with controller on, on my PC. Just it, The controls feel much better. Uh, especially like, the driving. The driving is what... fucking terrible with keyboard and mouse. Yeah, as it usually is. But, yeah. like, I, I, can't sh- I can't aim, like shooting with the controller it just makes me angry no at the you're world. right yeah, i take that back i take that back i have my controller set in front of my keyboard when i'm uh <laughs> when i'm shooting and stuff i use my keyboard and mouse when i'm driving i pick mm-hmm. up the controller that's that's what i do okay i've 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 read on like the steam forums that people did that and i've been thinking about yeah. it yeah that's, that's, that's like, the way to play that game definitely because but the like game i really want to hear about is um shoot mania so you guys touched on it before we just ended the book what, what do you guys feel like shoot mania is that actually any good or uh, it's too twitchy for my it's well the problem is i mean i think jeff covered a lot of it when he talked about it um it's it's the problem isn't just that it's twitchy it's this combination of it's twitchy and you have a very very limited um ammo supply before it recharges so like it's super twitchy but then yeah, you've only got like six shots that in my opinion well it's the the one map i was playing on it was just um the the rail gun because i know there are different weapons correct uh, there's there's the one basic weapon and then the other weapons are things that you can get by standing on certain places and using them yeah because like the one server i was playing on everyone had the rail gun i don't know what the hell was going on but that's insanity. it was like you know one one shot and there was a really long recharge and on, if you missed even just by a little bit you were boned for the next like five seconds yeah that's not that sounds yeah. so lame well, and, and the way the game the yeah. game works with your health, like you basically you take two shots. Like the first shot takes half your health. There is no health recharge. Second shot kills you. Yeah, with the railgun, it was one shot. Yeah. Kill, so I mean, you were pretty much dead to rights if you missed your shot. Yeah. yeah so I think I think I was game... hoping for like pretty much just because we've seen what Valve did with um what was a CS Live, whatever they're calling it. CS Go. Like, yeah. I just, yeah. I just I just kind of wanted a futuristic kind of take on CS. That's pretty much all I really wanted from. Um, now, if they did this like. The craziness and map editingness of like a track mania, but like well, a Twitch shooter, like something like Unreal Tournament, it would have been perfect. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Pro- the problem is like the part to be yeah. Good. The problem is like the craziness of track mania can't really be replicated in a shooter. Like you can't have when, when they in started, a shooter. When when they built it from the ground up, saying it, with it in their mind being like a competitive game, quote unquote. I was artist. This was just like <laughs> oh, they totally like, held just, a tournament I don't know, for some reason. Yeah, but they had day nine. Casting whenever it. someone builds a game to be competitive, it just doesn't sit right with me. Well, the problem is, I don't feel like the game is built to be competitive. I, I it's not built to be no, competitive. That, that is... game clearly needs a lot more balancing. The the problem you have too with like the competitiveness is like if you're building a game to be competitive, but you're building a game where it's focused around player created maps, those two fucking things don't go together. Like yeah. if you're playing that game at home, you're going to want to play on these player created maps because that's the fun of the Mania series. That's what makes Track Mania so good. That's what that's what I would imagine should make Shoot Mania so good. But like if you are not, say wanting to play they, as a, it's impossible to make it like um, a Track Mania for sh- for shooters because like what if they had like because my main problem with it is that their style set seems really fucking limited. Like what what if you could do shit like um, inverse gravity field and like areas of the map that literally like stick you to the ceiling. So that's like if you, if you turn around yeah, the corner, that, something on the scene that could be interesting. Or like, that like could be really cool, having yeah. almost a map that like where you're walking up the side of buildings because of those inverse yeah. gravity fields. Or they come up the top and you're standing on the top of the building stuff. That could be cool. Or even oh. something as simple as having all the bullets. Like let me <laughs> yeah. just hold that mouse button down and just fucking go nuts. Yep. That's track oh, mania. Man. Like yeah. going nuts Dance and just go, like yeah, taking everything much. to eleven. That is track mania. Shoot mania is is not that. Yeah. Sadly, I don't know. I bought into it. It's in case any of you guys are wondering, um, me and two other buddies went in on a three pack, 
it was a three pack for forty dollars US, which isn't bad at all. No, so yeah, I mean, even if it's not good, I don't really mind. Yeah, because it's tw- it's this twenty for like one person, thirteen dollars and change. Yeah, and you can get a five pack for less per person. I don't know, maybe it's, probably like maybe sixty or something. Yeah, I think it might even be like fifty five. Oh, wow, that would be less. I don't know. It's, know. it's not bad. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 when I saw that quick look, I just was not sold at all on. Yeah, oh, I've, I've, yeah, I, I did the, or I got the seven week or seven week, seven day uh, trial because I own Trackmania, and I played a little bit of it, and I, I don't really care to go back and play it again. It's <laughs> yeah, like I got the same thing, and I figured, eh, might as well at the very least, I'll record some video of it and tell everyone on the internet how much I disliked it. <laughs> Oh, so what are you going to do with that Guild Wars 1 stream? Is that going to happen? Are you, I guess, are you guys going to live stream some Guild Wars 1 before release? or I don't know. I don't see why not. We can pick something to do, like either do um, UW or Fissure of Woe or Sorrow's Furnace or, I don't know, Slaver's Exile, anything. We, we, you can't even get, any, get that in, uh, line. I, I probably want to be able to announce when that is. For uh, By the way, I'm not going to be... Like trying to host this segment, this is just gonna be free form. So we might we might just talk about stuff like this the entire time. But um, I I, I kind of want to be able to announce that next week's show. So it could be. Uh, I'm not in any position to be the one to stream it. Right. Um. So we would need to figure that out. Mage Knight, did, have you got Gilwas One? You don't have Gilwas One, do you? No. Rawson does, and he has Fiber. He he has Fios as well. He could, he probably could be the guy. Uh, well, anyway, that's, that's but, assuming he has a streaming option, though. Like. Good st- mm. like good streaming software costs money. That's true. And That's if he true. doesn't already have it, well, I don't remember if Rawson. Yeah. No, I take that back. Rawson, I think might have XSplit. I think he was asking me about him, it a while yeah, back. Find someone with an XSplit license. <laughs> yeah, I think he might have XSplit because like I have it, but I don't have Guild Wars One. Yeah, how do you how do you like Guild Wars? I, I think we we pretty much reached a consensus that after playing Guild Wars One, sorry, after playing Guild Wars Two, Guild Wars One feels like a cheap knockoff of Guild Wars yeah. Two, which is kind of hilarious looking way of, like think, way of looking back at it. Yeah, I think what I, what I said was that it felt like you know ArenaNet launches Guild Wars Two and then Nexon releases this game. <laughs> 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 well, if you go back to what like the original announcement for Guild Wars Two, or at least soon thereafter, they said. Guild Wars 2 is going to be the game they wanted to make with Guild Wars 1. Right, yeah. And I can definitely see that. I can, I can see that potential even in just the bit that we played. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's oh man, Guild Wars 1, looking back at I feel, it, like, I feel you like, can see all the roots. You can see the, the art style and all the other stuff. But Yeah, absolutely. That's why I feel like Guild Wars 2 is kind of similar to Skyrim in the regards that Skyrim is the game that Bethesda yeah. has wanted to make for Good years point. and they finally nailed it. Exactly. Like, we, have some, we have some Skyrim haters here last week, like Noob. I was, Ooh. At the, Ooh. yeah, I know, right? What's wrong with these guys? But yeah, no, Skyrim. It's very, it very much feels like Skyrim. Like the, all the menus just feel just right in a lot of ways that they haven't before. Um, like in in this case, obviously, it's not nothing but saving, but like the quest system just feels so much better. Like it does kind of the same thing. Like Skyrim, you kind of walk into the world and something happens. Like it's kind of the same thing in Guild Wars Two. Like you walk into the world, a dynamic event happens, and you just kind of hop in there. It's just really, I just, I just, yeah. I, but going back to Guild Wars 1, having quests and dudes with big green exclamation marks over their heads and stuff, is just it's hard to go back to that game. I can't man. left click to move my view. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing. God, that and, fucking and... threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> I kept trying to do it over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and, and what was it? Like, just like hitting spacebar. Like, I, yeah, spacebar to used attack. To... What? <laughs> yeah. And I, I've gotten used to Actually, it. I've gotten so used to that you know, C spacing. Just to, oh just to, I've gotten used to rolling with space, like dodging with spacebar, because I've, I've, I don't have space for map to jump. I have space for map to dodge, and it's like that's actually not a bad yeah, idea. That's yeah. a big thing too. Jumping isn't overly useful. No, <laughs> that's no, that's a big thing too. Is that I, I not in most combat. No, I came from MMOs where you could jump, and that was surprisingly jarring. Like not being able to, like you know, jump over a small rock or yeah. jump over a bush because apparently you can't walk through the bushes either. Exactly, and there was parts when I was no, able wait, to. No, that bush is rock solid. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, as far as I was able to show Duran like how they got around that, because we, we kind of like we went around Ascalon, and we found this like little beautiful vista with flowers and stuff, and there's like a waterfall there, and we went up to the edge of it, and I was like, this is kind of how to design around it, because I can't actually jump off this waterfall at all. I was like butting my head against the waterfall, and we kind of just stood there going. Yeah, I wish this was Guild Wars 2. <laughs> that was pretty much the entire the experience, fucking... yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, everything it's was just, just sad, I wish but... this was Guild Wars 2. Oh, man. Yeah, playing games without jumping and rolling just feels really weird now. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. I can't move. Dude, having to stop to cast are... was just the craziest oh, thing. 
Yeah. yeah. Between, between Guild Wars 2 and Star Trek Online, like, stopping to cast has become so weird for yeah. me. Yeah, so, so... Like, in Star Wars, you, 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 I mean, you need to, like, stop the channel and stuff, and it's just like, I don't... I need to move. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Constantly so, so, moving. So, speaking of, of going back to that kind of stuff, one of the things I have been playing this last week is Star Wars again. Um, Why? Really? So, they, they, <laughs> they launched the 1.3 update, and along with that, anybody who had a, an active account at some point um, got seven days of free game time to come in and check out the new update. So uh-huh. I'm not having to pay for it, so that's why I'm going back and playing some more Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, that makes and sense. The, not because you enjoy it. The, well, the first thing I did was you know use their new d- dungeon finder since that was the big thing that I was I felt <sighs> was missing from the game when I played it, and it was pretty much like you would expect. It was you know pretty decent wait time because you got to wait for the tank and the healer. I actually I haven't used it yet. It, it's it's I, mean, I have I have a healer character I'm leveling right now, so I should probably get on. Yeah, there if you I'm, if you I'm, use the one in WoW, it's very similar to that. You you choose your role, um, and then you kind of queue for whatever dungeons that are available for whatever level you are, um, and then you just kind of wait. And and when the group <laughs> is all compiled, hit the button and you're in, um, and then it drops you back yeah. out where you were. So like that that is really cool. Um but it's weird because like it only drops you out. No, I take that back. It does not drop you out where you were. I believe if you leave the group um you have to stand there and wait for about 30 seconds for it to kick you out of the instance because you're no longer a part of the group and when it kicks you out it kicks you out to that kind of instance hub area on the fleet. Mm-hmm. Um so what most people have been doing is just using their emergency fleet passes. The problem with that is, of course, uh, if you're you know chain running dungeons like I tend to like that? to do, what's, what's an emergency fleet pass? Emergency fleet pass is basically it's kind of like a WoW Hearthstone, except that it's um, one direction. It's, yeah, it's one direction. It always takes you to the fleet, and it has a slower cooldown than the game's actual uh, Hearthstone is, which their Hearthstone is right. more of like a choose a quick travel point and you go back there. Um, is it consumable? No, no. It, well, you you can actually you can, if you want to skip the cooldown, you can buy consumable. Yeah, version, and I think that's what people are doing. There, is they're buying the consumable. You get ones. you get an innate version that just has an eighteen hour cooldown. On yeah, it. right. I think that's, I think that's what people are doing is they're buying the consumable ones so that they can easily pour out of the dungeon when they're done. That's that's not how this should happen. Like you should just it should be like wow, you leave the group and it immediately kicks you out of the dungeon and brings you back to where you were when you joined the dungeon. No, fuck that. It should so, make yours too, where you can just fucking go. Anywhere, whenever, whenever you want to. Yeah, I wish. Well, I, yeah, yeah ideally, yes, but... Their, their engine can't really load. <laughs> no, we're talking about stuff. the hero it's engine uh, here. <laughs> yeah, t- we're talking about hero engine And so, here. like, Jeez. you know, I tried that out, and like I said, the, the dungeon fighter worked as I kind of expected to, aside from the, you know, method of leaving the dungeon. Um, and then actually from there, I hopped off of my, my high-level character and went back and started playing my bounty hunter. And I kind of started remembering why I enjoy playing the game back then which is the stories Aww. and the combat like the oh, combat yeah. is actually good um it's the right. story is, is interesting <laughs> like yeah it's all right well okay it's no guild wars 2 good but i've been playing <laughs> i've been wars playing 2. a lot of the secret world the combat in star what, wars what is good playing oh it's, it's oh man if, 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 they, if it's good compared to secret world man secret world must not be very good at all <laughs> secret world is very mediocre i've been playing uh, my oh, my man. main that i did the dungeon with was a uh um Oh, what are they called? It's the uh, the light side version of the assassin, um, Shadow. Oh, the the Shadow. Um, that's that's yeah. my main character. That's when I ran the dungeon. Yeah, with. that's a that's a pretty fun class. And then by. the the lower level one that I hopped onto was my bounty hunter. Yeah, the bounty hunter is also a pretty. Yeah, fun so here that's the one that I haven't tried. Having yet. played so much of the Secret World and having kind of that very generic, boring, not super fun combat, like I was actually having a lot of fun going back and playing Star Wars and, and doing the questing and stuff. It helped that I could actually now that they've expanded the legacy stuff uh i was able to purchase the ability to have a mount at level 10 so you, my, yeah. my bounty hunter was only like what's that oh no just a, just a quick question because well another quick question i'm trying to kind of just transition for how, now that you had so much time with secret world how, how do you feel about the the big skill circle thing like that way so, of developing, horizontal development so, of characters so yeah that's the other game i've been playing this week aside from star wars is the secret world because i'm an mmo junkie and i <laughs> i just do that um yeah, I, I, I've yeah. <laughs> apparently, um, well, I did buy a lifetime subscription to Star Trek Online. So, oh whoa, all right, you did? Uh, yeah, back when it launched. Yep. You haven't mentioned that. Today. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I still occasionally pop in. It's it's definitely much more of a game than it was when it launched. But anyway, going back to, are you part of the giant bomb fleet? No, or no. Um, I was actually in the Penny Arcade fleet. Um, that was oh, okay. when I was more a part of their community than giant bomb one. 
Um, but anyway, going back to the Secret World, uh, the more I've been playing that game, the more, um, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I'm starting to agree with Jeff on that game where there are some really cool things they're doing with it. The ability wheel has potential. Um, the the quest stuff is really neat. I like the writing in the game. The investigation quests, I actually enjoy it much more than Jeff, but that's because I have self control and I don't automatically spoil it's, it for it myself. It sounds like he did have self control. He just he just kept noting the fact that it is possible to really fuck it up for yourself. Like his, but no, his he didn't. He didn't have self control because he actually said that like he tried to do one of the one of the the investigation things and just kind of got annoyed with it and then just looked up the answer. No, but, but it wasn't that. It, it wasn't just that. That's true. But the thing was, it was the Morse code one where they they played to you the Morse code. And there was like no real the like, quick and easy way of converting that playback of the Morse code to an answer. But by the time the, the moment he said, "Hey, that's Morse code," the rest is just kind of just just bullcrap that they're making. They're forcing you to do. Like, I I agree with I him d- in saying that once you make that connection and you essentially solve the puzzle, you should just be able to go, "Yeah, that's Morse code," and the rest of the game, the game should just do. Feel- the fact that he looked up the I, answer I, to that one, I'm fine with. I think that that's uh, that's a difference of. Um, I I disagree with that. I really? think that it's really cool to be able to go like more than just to recognize, oh, this is Morse code. I actually find it really cool to be able to go in and put the time in and figure out what the Morse code says, put that into the game and have it work. Like that just feels fucking awesome. Right. I, I, I like, can that see is really, really cool. I mean, there was there was another one um, that I, I won't go into super crazy detail about, but it's one where you actually have to go and like pull. I think I've mentioned it before. We actually have to go and like pull a. Um, you have to go look at, look at basically a a uh, one of the in one of the books of the Bible, and within that, when you finally you know get it all down to that, there is a number that is within that um, the the line of that book, and that number is used to open a door, and if you can figure that out from beginning to end, and I even after me having done the quest, I actually um, was with some friends that had gotten the game kind of after the fact and were doing it for the first time. And kind of listening to them over vent, kind of puzzled out between each other and figure it out and, and eventually get to that solution. Like, nice. you feel fucking awesome when you do that. And so I think that the idea that Jeff kind of posed of, well, you figured out it's Morse code, so let's just go ahead and move it on from there. Like, no, like he's he's completely missing the point of that. It's not just the simple fact of, you know, with this quest, oh, well, that's just a scripture from the Bible. So hit button, let me in the door. Like, no, it's going that extra step and doing the work and figuring it out for yourself and having kind of this external... Um, work that you did and this external answer that you found outside the game then putting that into the game and having it work like that's just really really cool i, I can see that yeah I'll, I'll, I'll i will somewhat side with you in that one I, I can see there being a element of fun to actually being because i've never translated morse code for example there could be a real element of fun from that quest to make me translate morse code for the first time in my life I, that could be really awesome this exactly that for me and I think that's that was the difference there is that like maybe he had familiarity with Morse code in the past because he seems to know about crazy things like that. <laughs> Number stations. Um, <laughs> and, and so maybe he had familiarity with Morse code. So he was just like, oh, it's Morse code. I get it. Let me just, you know, move on, whatever. But for people like us who have never dealt with Morse code because we're normal people, um, to have to go through and, and kind of transcribe that Morse code and figure out what it's saying, that's cool. Could, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting accomplishment, both in terms of playing a game and also something you're doing in real life as well. Yeah. That's, that now funny. that said, <laughs> um, going back to the ability wheel and your and your question with it. So one of the things I did is I kind of exper- decided to start an experiment when I first started the game uh, on live. And what that experiment was was there's this other thing that and he, ta- he talked about d- that during the podcast as well, where there's the um, kind of pre-made decks that they that they have included in there that where they say like if you want, like for instance in my case, uh, pistol and shotgun. And those are the two weapons you want to use. Here's a, you know, kind of predetermined set of passive and active abilities that you can grab and, you know, do pretty well with these. Like, this is this is something we're suggesting. You can obviously deviate if you want to. Um, but, you know, for somebody who wants to just kind of be hand-fed a build and doesn't want to create it themselves, we're giving you that. Like, that's that seems to be the intention of these decks, right? Right. So I decided to pick one of those, and mine was, you know, like I said, the shotgun pistol one, um, and, you know, build my character towards that. So when you choose that deck, um, it kind of outlines on your ability wheel where, like, in which section 
there is an ability and how many there are. And when you go into that section, you'll see kind of a circle next to that ability to let you know that's the one you need to work towards in that, in that section. Um, right. So I've gotten to the third zone in the game and I basically hit a brick wall where there were quests. I, it's not that I couldn't progress through the zone, but there were quests that I just straight up could not do because of my build. There was what? one in particular. I, ha- I had to kill like 13 zombies within seven minutes. I couldn't do it. Wow. I couldn't kill 13 enemies in seven minutes. What the hell? And what it, and what it came down to was I needed to go and re- I needed I needed a heal. I needed a self-heal. There was no way of healing in the game other than consumables, which you have to basically get through either randomly picking up off an enemy or crafting them. There is no there's no potion vendor. Right. Um, so I needed to get a self-heal in order to actually progress through, especially that quest, because it was timed. So what I ended up having to do, because your your abilities are purchased with ability points that you earn through leveling and through doing quests, was I actually had to go back to the previous zone because it was easier content, so it was quicker to do it, and redo a whole bunch of quests that I'd already done oh. in order to earn enough ability points to buy my way through this tree in oh, order to so unlock a self-heal. God damn. And once I had that self-heal, like, yeah, things have gotten so much better now because now every 30 seconds I can heal myself for like 600 and something damage. But the right. fact that I needed the fact that that was the only solution to this problem that shouldn't have existed in the first place because I went with a pre-built deck that the yeah. developers told me, "Hey, you can do this and, you know, you don't need to worry about making your own build because this should be viable." Ah, uh, yes. Well, how much of that was because you went rolling with other people? Um, that shouldn't be an issue. I that's if you're true. making a game, if you're making <laughs> an MMO in 2012, <laughs> that shouldn't be an issue. Like that's I feel like solo play being available from beginning to end is standard in, in MMOs now. Uh, and if 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 that was their intention with this game, then um, they, they they might have they gone down a bad up. path. They done fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> they done fucked up. So I'm back. What were you guys talking about? Uh, no, we were just talking about The Secret World and Swotor. It's oh. nothing important, really. Ugh. How was Darksiders? <laughs> yeah. Have you finished that yet? <laughs> um, no, I'm at like right before um, where you get ruined. The oh, horse. So that's so cool. That bit was awesome. I'm just at like the time slowy downy part. Right. Yeah. That game's so much that's, fun. That game is so, so good. And so dumb. It's so, so amazing. <laughs> like you get like a I'm huge like laser rifle lately. in that game to shoot down angels and shit. It's <laughs> freaking awesome. Oh, man. Uh, that game's fun. Yeah. I hope to. Um, I hope to. I'm partial to the scythe. Partial to the scythe of the secondary weapon. Just saying. Um, See, I pretty much options. I pretty much stuck to the sword the entire game. Same. I, oh no, I like the scythe because it has that the, like the AOE built. In yeah, the scythe is good for crowd control. I do recall myself using that one as my secondary weapon. Oh no, I, I know what it was. For, I, I used the cestas as my second. Um, have you gotten those yet? Psh, the, the no, I don't think so. I just have the the scythe and like the fists. That's yeah, the cestas, the fists. Oh, because the the, yeah, the yeah. ground pound for them knocks everyone up. Like it's it's like the God of War one. So you beat a, beat the ground yeah. up times, and everyone gets knocked up into the air, and then you can do crazy shit with them. Like that's that's I always get that equivalent weapon, which apparently is in every game since God of War one. That <laughs> you, bound, you pound the ground, and everyone gets knocked up in the air, and then you can fucking rip them up. That that's always been my favorite way. So the sisters are where it was at for me for that game. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I like the scythe just because of the, the built-in crowd control. Yeah, you can like hold down. Y or like this triangle because I'm using a PS3 controller and just have like knock down everyone around you. That, that, that's actually so um, useful. something I mean, I brought up on Skype because I actually have like a another group of friends, you know, just outside of you guys. But I was <laughs> <What>? <laughs> what? really I, I was br- br- I brought it up with them and um, it's a point of. I was watching a bunch of Guild Wars 2 like PvP content because I, I'm still kind of deciding whether I want to um, main a warrior or try out. To see if I can really get a ranger working for Guild Wars Two. You seem like you really like the warrior, man. I love man. the I don't warrior, know. man. But, <laughs> you, um, you, you love the yeah, warrior. Yeah, I do. But I, I want to see if I if I can get ranger rolling with me because I it sounds like at least on the surface the the longbow looks like just a better rifle. But then I do the math on it. It's oh. only about. No, the rifle sounds like a better longbow. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> exactly. about. Exactly. I did the math point. on it, right? Guys, we just talked about Guild Wars 2 and for over, like two over and a half like, hours. Just talk about something Over like else. a 10-minute period, the rifle actually is only about 10% less damage than the long. Anyway, so the point was, um, I was looking at a bunch of Guild Wars 2 PvP videos, and they kept using, like, WoW terms. Like, CC is was never something we used 
in back in old school Gear Wars. It's just 1. not really a WoW term. It's just MMO, MMO term. MMO term. Uh, well, yeah. How do you guys? Yeah, how do you guys feel about like so much jargon in the MMO space? I think it's really. I know most of it. It's not just MMOs. Yeah, that's I mean, that's it's, it's weird. that's games in general. I mean, it's uh, it's crossover to MOBAs too. Like in in Han and Dota, we use CC. Yeah, and well, and like even that. even beyond yeah, just yeah. those words, I mean, you you go talk to somebody who plays a lot of StarCraft and just see all the jargon that spe- spews out of their mouth. I mean, oh, I mean, jargon in general is a video game. Yeah, thing, yeah, yeah, or just a just a hobby thing, really. It's any any complex thing has jargon. I, yeah. I guess, but, was, but I like, don't know. I feel like video games um, abbreviations are more <laughs> not abbreviations um, like acronyms or. More prevalent. I think I actually think it's pretty bad for the industry in general because I I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have noticed, but throughout this podcast that we've been doing, I've essentially been trying to keep it to the point where we very rarely use any form of acronym or jargon, except for WVW, like Wolf of. Like I use that. Yeah, I said UW, Wolf and then you needed to point out what it and, was. And, and SPVP um, for structured PVP. And I, I actually already feel bad just using those two terms. Like I try to always say w, world versus world when I say WVW yeah. and structure PvP when I use the term SPVP. Like I, I try to use it in the, like within the same paragraph. Like how do you guys feel it is for the industry? I think it's really hard for new people to get into it with all this crap. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, think I, I don't feel like it's worse than barrier entry, entry, but it's not. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Yeah, I don't think it's really you pick it up pretty fast. Yeah, I don't think it's really hard for somebody to, new to get into it because the thing is, like, the concept is still there regardless of whether you give it a name or not. I mean, you talk about an MMO, you know, the idea of CC. Like, you go and play WoW as a new player, even if you don't know that it's called CC. You, you know, you know that this ability puts an enemy to sleep, and that's important. Hey, stun those guys. Yeah, but, uh, that's that's like the core point. Like when I, because I've always con- been interested in doing PvP coverage for Guild Wars Two, right? Um, and I was talking to Dura a couple of weeks ago and saying, hey, dude, this, there's actually not a much of good commentary, like legitimately good commentary for Guild Wars PvP because obviously it's a new game. But I, I think there's a huge hole in the market there. Of course, being Australian, my upload pre- speeds are complete shit, so I'd never re- I doubt I'd ever really get the opportunity to go into that. But what, I, there's a huge difference between chill in Guild Wars 2 and uh, cripple in Guild Wars 2. I think it's far more informative for the casual viewer, for me to say, oh, and he just chilled that dude, so he's going to be slowed down, he's going to be um, having slower cooldowns for his skills. Like, being able to actually uh, vocalize and use whole terms to describe things like crowd control, CC, um, stuff like that is just more informative and probably a better listening experience to the majority of viewers. Well, so well I mean, if you're talking about... A lot of people are going out of their way to watch, like, oh, Guild Wars 2 stream odds are they know what cc means well not just that but if you're, yeah, if you're talking about like the idea of, of essentially commentating what's going on that's why generally when you see commentating on a game like a moba or like starcraft 2 or something generally they pair up two commentators one that is very technical and they are there for the players who clearly know the game and the other one like total biscuit where they're there they're, they're not nearly as technical they they use the, the full-on terms um, and and are there basically for the people who don't know anything about the game or know very little about it but you know are still interested enough in it to want to go check it out, and and they give them that information, like you're saying, where they you know they, they maybe spell things out a bit more and cover kind of more the the broad stuff as opposed to kind of the the more fine details that the uh, the, the core it's, players it's are, are looking for. Because uh, to some extent, yeah, I think all the best ones do that. I agree. Like all, all the best ones have like the the really in depth guy, and then the guy who spells things out. But I, I think it's interesting because things like CC only saves you about three seconds maximum, and in a lot of cases, you can you can sit there and say, "Hey, use chill," and straight, straight up, chill is just as fast to say as, as CC. Cripple is just as fast to say as CC in a lot of cases. Right. So it's just it's hard, it's weird that people well, use the these terms. terms. Well, you're talking it's situational, across multiple I guess. games. Well, and you're talking also like. You know, vocally, yes, it's much easier to say. However, if you know we're, these are these are terms that have come around since before people were really on vent playing these games together, and it's much easier to type CC than it is to say, "Oh yeah, chill that guy," yeah. or yeah. you know yeah. that. Not to mention, CC is kind of a an umbrella term that like, encompasses yeah. like slows. Stuns, that's, that's my main silence, problem with it. Not silence, my main but. problem with it is a lot of these a lot of these commentators are using really broad terms for things that really do warrant. A little bit more segregation and separation, like the, the fact that they people describe a hammer as a, a low damage weapon with lots of CC options. How, how is that informative? Like, is it's it, that, that's informative to me. I, I know that it's, 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 it's what kind yeah, of CC? It's for There's so many down. types of CC I, in Guild Wars too. Like, how's, how's it, that? Doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't it's, matter. It's, it's, it's CC, and that's what's it's important. all about locking guys down. Yeah. yeah. I, 
if it's if it's a slower or a stun or I mean, I mean the only, yeah, if I was like super theory crafting, it would yeah, be like the only time that, that like you know one CC from another matters is when you have CCs that maybe work on you know A, B, and C CCs all work on you know right. one diminishing return, and then D or and F work on another does, diminishing like, return. This is skill that's bonus damage on stun targets, and you are you're obviously looking for stuns over slows, yeah. et cetera. Right, and I, I feel like I feel like yeah, I feel like, like you have to assume. CCs. Yeah, I feel like you have to assume that the, the player is at least somewhat intelligent. And stuff like that. Yeah, so Tarkin's pretty much hitting Not what I'm bad. going with it because like I, I agree that to I think it's it's interesting because we're kind of saying two things. So for a person who wants to a quick glance at what a weapon does, then a low damage weapon with lots of CC options is is a very fast way to, to get a general feel for that weapon, right? But at the same time, a a low damage weapon with a knockback, a knockdown, and a stun, right? It serves your purposes because you can read that and know exactly what the weapon does. But it also serves people like me who are a bit more of the theory crafting side, and it's it kind of serves both audiences versus just the one. Don't you guys see where I'm coming from with that? Yeah, yeah. maybe. I mean, there are there are people that definitely um, do that. I mean, like as you probably know, you know, Togram does a great job of yeah, explaining Togrim the fights as they go through, and you know, he'll say he, he may say, you know, I'm gonna you I'm gonna use this thing to CC this target and knock him down. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so like, he, the, he's incredible. As I said, there's only about two or three really good commentators out there, but he's definitely one of them. Torgrim, for people who are listening, I, I forgot people even listening to this. For people who are listening, Torgrim is a YouTuber. He does a bunch of Star Wars, like Swoto content, was it? And uh, Yeah, he's, de- he's on the uh, Republic cast on Game Breaker. Yeah, and, and he does a, a, a lot of really good Guild Wars 2 coverage. And he's, he's speaking of expanding that towards the future. He's going to be one of the members of the Build cast, which is one of, one of the things um, Game Breaker is bringing in, hopefully next week, uh, which is going to be for people like me who like theory crafting. But yeah, enough of the... Your build Wars 2. And build Wars 2. <laughs> yeah, enough of the Guild Wars 2 talk. Um, so, Major, what have you been playing, anyway? Uh, you know, some Star Wars, some... <laughs> Some Han, some Dota. Oh, you like, That's just you, mean, you, Cynic. That's just mean. He says yeah. he's been playing some Star Wars and you just laugh at him. <laughs> 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 well, I, I'm surprised that you... I, I didn't know you were a MOBA player. How, how, do, you, how do you feel oh, about yeah, the MOBA Yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty major MOBA player. Uh, is MOBA... Is, how do you feel about the MOBA scene? Is that, is that kind of where you game most of the time? Or? It's... Uh, yeah, it's actually where I spend a lot of time. But I think it's, it's healthy and thriving and it's... It, Pretty cool time for MOBAs right now. What do you? Th- wh- Wait, where did you, you say it's a healthy the- environment? <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, I would one hundred percent disagree with that statement. <laughs> okay, no. Okay, so the, the people are. It's healthy if they like there's, you. There's the game, it's healthy people. for the games. It's not healthy for okay, the people. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, but where, where do you fall in the divide um, in terms of which MOBA you prefer? Uh, I definitely prefer Han Dota over League of Legends, Smite, that sort of thing. That's that's, that's yeah. That's, that's, I don't know if I would include Smite in that conversation. It seems like a pretty game being it's person, still a mobile yes and i think it's, Smite it's is of, only of, different because of the camera angle really from what i'm noticing yeah it's 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 of the of the lol family yeah hmm. i guess no i just i just, I just uh, find I'm it not interesting a big mobile fan, um, but if i had to pick i would pick dota yeah dota because uh, dota 2 is like the only one that i've played because i got into the beta like a while ago mm. I, mean, I think so i played like three matches uh, it's actually a really cool thing coming <laughs> off the um the terminology argument how do, how do you feel about the dota community uh mage Knight? I, I hate it i hate pretty much everyone i've it, met <laughs> it's it's unfortunate but it is the way it is for a reason like it's it's a complex game with a huge learning curve and people like to win and unfortunately There's a lot of interdependency yeah, right that's that's kind of what it comes yeah from. it's yeah, one it's, one it's, person it's, can it's, it's a team game, game. And yeah one person can screw over the game, so that's that's kind of what it, it is. It is an unfortunate side effect of what makes the, the genre good, which is its complexity oh, and technicality. Yeah, I just I just can't ever see myself a because I know that if I really get into one of those games, it's going to take up my entire life. Oh yes, but, yeah, hours. I, 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 I do a Guild Wars two podcast, and we played only seventy hours of the game. I, I, I'm going to, oh, yeah, I'm not going to stay. I'm going to stay well away <laughs> from most. See, see also, for me, my, my biggest my biggest issue with them is. I, I don't know that I would want to play them because I don't like playing games with assholes. Exactly. That's I, that's my <laughs> other problem. They're jerks. Then why are you playing video games? <laughs> yeah. No, because the only I'm video, the only video games I play online really nice. for the most part are MMOs, and I can choose who I play with. That's true. But that's a good point. Sometimes, yeah, but like straight up, you turn off that all. Pretty chat. much everyone I've ever played with from GB or just like meeting them in the world in Guild Wars Two has just been a really cool person. I've never met a. It's kind of because GB Two doesn't have any like griefing systems. It kind of takes out like world, open world PvP and that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it's just so weird 
going from this game to like one like that where one's all happy happy and one's just fucking i think it's under the hatred tree in our mumble server jesus <laughs> <laughs> well yeah and, and i mean yeah there are assholes in every game but the asshole yeah. ratio is much higher in a moba than pretty much anything else pretty much maybe yeah, maybe just, with oh. the exception being counter-strike that's why it's, it's best to go in with friends because your friends can kind of help you through mm. it and protect you from assholes yeah jeez <laughs> And is there such thing as like guilds and stuff in that as well, or there are there uh, there are clans. There's clan support in Han. There's going to be clan support in Dota pretty soon. Okay. Uh, how does that work in that context? Uh, in Dota, I mean, you you I mean, well, in both games, you sort of just assemble a list of players. It just it you it's just a second friends list basically. Oh, right, cool. like, at least in Han, in Dota, there's gonna be a little bit more support for like you can have a team with a flag and stuff. Hmm. Okay, but and is it? I'm not sure if there's any like group stat track or anything yeah. in, in Dota, but exactly. So, is there any like, like benefits to being in clan aside from having people to play with, or it's, it's just people to play with? It's not really, right. and that's pretty much the biggest benefit you could have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it that's really true. is definitely true. I, I, yeah, again, it's just, it's it's weird because I've 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 been so deep in the like, Guild Wars two hole that I've had to like do other stuff to get my mind out of it. Every time I hear about another game, on down the I always hole. compare it to Guild. It's like the most annoying thing I do at the moment. I compare it to Guild Wars everything Guild Wars two, but um I've I've had to like if anyone asks me like I'm with I'm on Duran Pod- Duran's podcast tomorrow, and when he asks me what we've been playing, I I'll, I'll have to say like I've been reading uh playing that game i've been reading like fantasy novels and shit this week thank you very much just to get my mind off things it's, it's, yeah, i've been reading too what have you been reading i just started i just started uh, a feast for crows oh oh nice, nice. that's a pretty good pick is so. that the third book fourth fourth book oh that yeah. one's unfortunate <laughs> yeah so i've heard yes um, but yeah i don't know i can't decide what i want to read next after i finish um the fifth book I don't know which series I want to start. Uh, yeah, just just, just go all the way down the the epic fantasy uh, hole and do uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel Hell of Time. Hell yeah, Wheel of Time! That's what I was thinking. <laughs> High five! I was major. like, I, I have like a few you. months before the last one comes out or whenever it's coming out. I have to read all like thirteen other. I've ones. read all of them <laughs> t- two and a half times now. And I, I love. I wow. love. Yeah. I, I could not get yeah. halfway. I got halfway Cinecomber, through. I'm gonna I, put something in the uh, the Skype. <laughs> chat hold on i have to find something for you but um also i've been reading like the, the, the last two last couple of those books being finished by an author called brandon sanderson he's my favorite author of all time from his work on like mistborn mm. and, and, and um a bunch of other really good works and so i i've been i i, I told myself to not read um the stormlight archive which is the newest series until a couple of books have come out because they're going to be like five years between each or like two to three years between each book but i just caved and started reading the first book of the Stormlight Archive, and it's freaking amazing. It's called The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. It is absolutely spectacular. Oh, man. Anyway, is anyone else playing anything? Or can we round this out? We're out, we're out like three hours, 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I was thinking of starting to read the Dark Tower series. Just I cause. didn't like it. I Yeah, yeah I, I started like that uh, last year. I read the first book, and I started the second one. I haven't gotten any further. Does it, can, like, does it get better? <laughs> I haven't read it. I've only read, like, about... Four, fifth, about ten chapters of the first book, and I just couldn't like the first it. book isn't bad. It's just it feels a little t- Tolkien esque in that like it takes forever for anything to actually happen. Yeah, it's just it's it's, it's Tolkien esque, but it's see, I, I'm I'm a person who doesn't mind traditional fantasy, but also like when people do something new. He does something new with that series, but not in a way I like. <laughs> so it's just like well, the, the, the continuity of, his, of it. I feel like it's a little hard to. Well, the continuity of it, I feel like, is a little hard to follow because he constantly jumps back and forth through like flashbacks, time and then real time, and then flashback, and then flashback. Yeah. Well, he's, he's apparently is rewriting the other them all. Really? Hmm. Yeah, I was reading on the Wikipedia page of the series. He said that the you know the series is essentially a rough draft, and he's going to go back and rewrite them and fix all the continuity issues. That's that's weird. crazy. That just tells me not to buy to any more the series. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Aside from fantasy, I am a huge fan of dystopian fiction. Oh, I hate dystopian so fiction. I was, oh, my God. Oh, I love God. it. So I was thinking of it's reading so the, um, <laughs> the Other Land series. I don't know if they're any good or not. Cool. Never heard of it. It's basically like, from what I was reading, like a brief synopsis, it's pretty much like kind of similar to The Matrix, except it's like the, the world that everyone gets trapped in is um, basically an equivalent to an MMO. Hmm. Hmm. That sounds interesting. Know. Yeah, they shit. do seem interesting. They're apparently what is it called? Other, Otherland? Otherland, yes. Okay. It's kind of cool. 
Yeah, I'm happy to look uh, at that. Yeah, one. yeah. I, I'm, 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 I, I can't. Well, uh, okay. So the Matrix One was about the most dystopian thing I've enjoyed. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> it's not even well. It's, yeah, pretty, it's pretty dystopian. dystopian. But that's that's about as 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 far as I go down dystopian fiction. I just don't. Anyway, this isn't a books podcast. We can run out the show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, I'm not going to edit this second half or this second hour or whatever it is. Uh, I think I should do a pretty good show today. But anyway, we can stop recording. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.